peace with this country and its people, for the privileges of natural wealth in diamond, gold, iron ore, and rich soil, none of which we have come to fully appreciate. And for the numerous circumstances he has given us, which we have constantly misused and abused. We ask God the Almighty to give Liberians another chance, particularly through these TRC activities, so that we can correct our grave mistakes, change our ugly ways, including our proclivity to blossom in hypocrisy, hate, envy, discrimination, and simple stealing. We pray that the people and the government will feel sorry for each other and that after the TRC closes its activities, there will be more peace for Liberia and no reason to engage in another war. God please give the commissioners and their colleagues at the TRC the wisdom to realize that they are the drivers in this process and we the rest of the Liberian people are the passengers and that though we may not necessarily like each other as individuals and groups in this country we have one destination we are one nation and we must get along in order to survive and attain prosperity May Allah bless us and show the way. Amen. Members of the Commission, ladies and gentlemen, having already submitted nearly 100 pages of interview to the inquiry unit of the TRC in the past several months, I come here today in response to your invitation to discuss with you, like others have done these few days, about what has happened to our country. We congratulate you, the commissioners, for your bold resolve to face the task before you. My re recollection and reflections here today are done partly within the framework of my humble and very limited academic exposure in Liberian and American universities to the obtaining of a bachelor's degree in economics a bachelor's degree in law, a master's degree of law in international legal studies, a doctor of juridical science candidacy, a master's degree in journalism and public affairs, and the pending conferral of a master's degree in international relations. My recollection and reflection shall also be done on the basis of my professional political, economic, cultural, military, and personal activities over the past several decades. I shall endeavor to share with you the results of my research and analysis of early Liberian history, tracking down the mindset that destroyed us, the sources of our national financial mismanagement, the disrespect, disdain, and exploitation of our labor force and how we stopped being a nation of self-sufficiency in rights and also in a population politically imprisoned by rights. I shall tell you by the grace of God what I saw as a youth during the Tubman administration and what I observed and did or did not do during the administration of President William R. Tarver, Jr. and Samuel K. Doe, Sr. I will endeavor to narrate what I also saw during the administration of the various interim governments. Rest assured, I shall share with you information on my role during the war, along with the role of ULIMO, other factions, ECOMOG, the UN missions, Pacific African and non-African leaders, and other stakeholders. You will also hear from me specifically based on my experiences in normal and critical moments when I served one time or the other 
as Minister of Information, Vice Chairman of the Council of State of the Collective Presidency of Liberia, Director General of the Liberia Broadcasting System, Press Secretary to the Vice President of Liberia, Benny Warner, as Professor of Communication and International Law at the University of Liberia, to the President, in the private sector as Director General of the Liberia Institute for Strategic Studies, Representative of the European Union Center for the Development of Industry in Liberia, Consultant to the National Bank, now Central Bank, and as a United Nations Development Program Consultant during my refugee period in the Republic of Guinea. You'll also hear from me on how, as President of the National Soccer Champions, Major Barro, I learned how sports can bring about unity and reconciliation. I shall let you know what I learned as President of the Lofa County Citizens Association of Washington, D.C., as President of the Lofa County Student Association University of Liberia, and as Chairman of the Student Unification Party at the University of Liberia, where we help to liberate some of the professors that were summarily dismissed. At this time, let me salute those who have appeared before the Commission and told the truth. In some cases, confessing serious wrongdoing. They have appeared knowing or not knowing the guidance provided by the Constitution of Liberia, as well as the tenets of due process provided for under the principles of international law. Article 21 of the Constitution of Liberia prohibits anyone from furnishing evidence against himself. The subpoena power given the TRC requires everyone cited to come forth and by legal extension refrain from saying anything that is not the truth. The subpoena power has the effect of demanding appearance and then compliance with presenting the truth. Where therefore, someone came before the TRC and admitted a serious wrongdoing as in the case of one of the past witnesses. And that individual demonstrates repentance and acts of forgiveness in the name of reconciliation. That individual has accordingly disavowed impunity. For impunity is having the sense of remorse and not willing and not willing to adjust one's life and character. It must be presumed by operation of substantive law that the confessor relied on the genuineness of the surety that the confessor was in confession, was in a truthful reconciliation and nothing entrapping. Like those who have appeared before me in recent days, I come here today realizing that the purpose of the gathering is to tell and hear the truth about the events that have given the type of nation state we have today. I recognize the need to honestly evaluate our history, truthfully narrate, and present my experiences and my views on what should be the next step in the history of our nation that will be co-terminus with functional democracy and durable peace. If you hear your name or the name of your family in my presentation in an unfavorable way, please accept my regrets. <laughs> For it is not personal, nor is it based on hate. These are just factual historical accounts. Let me now move on with some brief encounter with early Liberian history where we have identified factors of psychosocial disequilibrium, a serious disconnect between the mindset and the society as the most important root cause of the problems Liberia faces today. Our early history. The escape from racial subjugation in the United States and the subsequent constitutional caveat that helped to prevent white people from ruling Liberia 
was an achievement of those Liberians who came from overseas. Unfortunately, the early victory did not translate into the preservation of African values in Liberia, nor did it see the unrestricted application of the tenets of democracy that we should have experienced in the United States. The free black people who originated and founded the first African Republic in the midst of the European scramble for Africa, ironically elected to pursue an attitude of skin color, cultural and religious discrimination. They excluded whites from citizenship, which was understandable under the circumstances, but then confined the benefits of a democratic constitution to only a few. The parameters of the settlers' universe for citizenship simply excluded the indigenous. We should have followed the vision of reconciliation and population integration propounded by founding fathers like King Sao Boso, otherwise known as Chief Boswin, Chief Zanga, erroneously called Chief Bob Gray, Edward Wilmer Blyden, and Benjamin J.K. Anderson. Yes. Firestone, for example, in Liberia, could have been a robust base for transforming our land and our indigenous manpower into skilled participants of manufacturing. Only if we had followed the patriotic sense of men like Edwin Barclay and Louis Arthur Grimes, who legally questioned leasing of one million acres of Liberian land for the exploitation of cheap raw material and labor without a caveat for the production of rubber products. Sao Boso was leader of the Congo Confederacy, which covered northern and western Liberia before the arrival of the settlers. The king who was Madingo and Muslim was the leader that came from his capital of Bopolu to Monrovia to reconcile the settlers and the indigenous in the area, telling them to consider each other as members of one African heritage. Sao Boso earlier led a combined army of Madingo, Loma, and Bandi warriors from Upper Lofa to establish a safe security corridor for traders and travelers along the highway between Lofa and the coastal areas by way of present-day Bapolu County. When the Truth and Reconciliation Conference was held in what is today Vitown in Monrovia, dealing with the conflict between the settlers and the Day Basa people, the various representatives, no doubt, drew on the moral teachings of their religious background. Sao Boso, being a Muslim, the settlers, being Christians, and the Mamba and Basa people, belonging to the African spiritual religion. At that conference, a convergence of the principles of three religions and the philosophy of peaceful coexistence certainly may have paved the way for the founding of the Republic of Liberia. Whether the principles of these three religions have translated into a clean system of governance with equal rights can be determined by our presence here today. Sao Boso's ability to put together a confederate type administration of autonomous chieftaincies spanning the vast territory from the Den Tuman River to the coast, from the Lofa River in the west to the Simpoa River in the, in the east, showed that it was possible for mutual respect and cooperation to exist among rivals. Sao Boso brought together his rivals in one administration, including Chief Zuguro of Fuama, who is the grandfather of the late Senator Bodo Barclay of Bond County. The accomplishments and peace efforts of the king were, were distinctly recognized only 150 years later when a descendant of the settlers, President William R. Torbo Jr., renamed Front Street in Monrovia 
as King Salbosu Street. <laughs> I was told that another prominent descendant of the settlers at the top of Front Street simply refused to accept the name Salbosu Street. Yes, indeed, if we are taking practical lessons of mutual assimilation from the Basa chief Zanga, who preached the ideals of unity and integration between the settlers and the indigenous, we would have had a different Liberia today. Besides being erroneously called the Bob, the, uh, Bob Gray by the settlers, he was disrespected in some history books in which he was illustrated carrying a bucket of water on his head, though he was being referred to as chief of the Basa people. Our chiefs don't put buckets on their heads. Edward Wilmer Bryan was perhaps the most ardent intellectual advocate for the assimilation of the rich African culture among the settlers. He traveled widely and wrote profusely about the virtues and advantages of black people from everywhere, respecting their African roots and how Liberia stood to be a great nation if its leaders would listen. Very much J.K. Anderson, a middle-level official in the government, President James Strix Payne, believed in the expansion of Liberia by the connecting of the interior people with the coasts, the coastal settlers. With guidance from King Sao Bosu's son, Sao Mamalu, B.J.K. Anderson traveled to the western Madingos in Musadu, when the Madingo chief Vabula Dole expressed enthusiasm in becoming part of the emerging Liberia. Anderson was indeed embarrassed on his second trip to Musadu as he had gotten no serious response from the administration of President Ping in Monrovia about the message of interior integration. As a result, the entire Guinea forest region was taken over by the French when they eventually colonized the territory of Guinea. Imagine the population and the resources that could have been as added to Liberia then, not speaking of the expanded territory. In yet another historical development, Liberia probably missed a chance to embark on an ambitious mission of integrating not only the settlers and the so-called country people, but also promoting pan-Africanism and attracting manufacturing entrepreneurship. Followers of Marcus Garvey, the New York-based Jamaican pan-African activist, said while the American Liberian administration was giving Firestone one million acres of land, they were preventing Garvey from obtaining land to use as a base for the propagation of pan-Africanism. Garvey founded the 1916 United Negro Improvement Association, UNIA, that canvas for massive migration of blacks back to Africa as part of the process of liberating the continent from colonial hold. The campaign did not go down well with France and Britain, leading to their complaint to the United, Na United States and the Liberian governments. Garvey chose Monrovia, capital of the, of the continent's only republic in 1920, as the ideal place for union headquarters. He was preparing to carry at least 25,000 members of his organization, mostly black Americans. Garvey told the Liberian government he would raise up to $2 million to liquidate the country's troubling debt to the West. In exchange for the establishment of the Union base, the government of President Charles D.B. King banned Garvey from coming to Liberia, accusing the Union of preaching racial hatred. Marcus Garvey in turn accused the American Liberian leadership of treating the majority indigenous population as slaves on their own soil. Recognition of the interior population. When the settlers' government attempted to focus on the usefulness of the interior population, 
It had already taken some 80 years since independence in 1847. And yet, that recognition had nothing to do with citizenship or democracy. The Firestone Corporation of the United States had arrived. Rubber plantation is labor intensive. And if the cost of the workforce is cheap, that's a core motive for the choice of the investor who goes to a developing country. With the right and privilege to cultivate up to one million acres anywhere in a country, the concessionaire had to have worries about the problems of finding, recruiting labor, and then deal with the rights of the inhabitants of the land that is to be cultivated. That is, if there were a legal system based on the rule of law and ahead to international law. The labor requirement of Firestone and later the scandalous Fernando Poe labor contract lay at the bottom of the new interest to the interior population. Firestone fought for and got agreement to require the Liberian government to encourage, support, and assist the company to secure and maintain an adequate labor supply. The Liberian government appeared confident in executing this phase of the contract, relying on the indigenous population. The British replacement with an American commander of the Liberian Frontier Force could not have come at a better time. The Liberian Frontier Force, which is the National Army of Liberia, was unsparingly used to not only quell ethnic uprising under the British commander, Major Cradle, but was also used to exact taxes out of the rural population. The new American commander had proven he could mimic his British predecessor in wielding excessive power in Liberia, but with absolute loyalty to America. Besides using the LFF, the previous administration of President Arthur Barclay, excuse me, let me get rid of the phone. The new, the new American commander had proven he could mimic his British predecessor in wielding excessive power in Liberia, but with absolute loyalty to, to the America. Besides using the LFF, the previous administration of President Arthur Barclay already had a recruitment system in place. Despite the armed conflicts between the government and the indigenous and the external criticism of the policy toward the rural people, Arthur Barclay had initiated an elaborate interior administration in an attempt to regulate the inhabitants. That was 1912, about a dec decade before the event of Firestone. At the top of Barclay's interior structure was the district commissioner who was officially responsible to maintain law and order and protect the chiefs against exploitation by foreign states and traders. The commissioners, interestingly too, were supposed to encourage farming, though there was no incentive given for production. Perhaps the catch in this reality was that the chiefs were obligated to provide labor for a variety of activities besides the monthly sacks of rice and tin of palm oil that had to be given the commissioner, a direct representative of the president of Liberia. Villagers and townsmen without pay were instructed to be available for the construction of homes, barracks, and the homes of the district commissioners. They also worked on government farms which, in effect, were farms of the commissioners. Few indigenous Liberians live outside of their community setting, besides the coastal tribes, some of whose members have become career seafarers. The bulk of the people remain dependent on subsistent farming and rural life, loyal to their families and the chieftaincy. Barclay used this chieftaincy network in his attempt to establish and maintain some control. Firestone began with government guidance and active cooperation, dealing with the powerful chiefs who were reluctant to permanently relinquish their able-bodied men. 
except for the coastal seafarers, the more interior tribes generally remain in their localities even if they, if they have fulfilled their obligation to the district commissioners. Firestone set up a compensation scheme for the chiefs, giving each of them 15 cents per month for every worker recruited during the rice growing season from January to June, and then 10 cents from July to December. That sum up to $1.50 per May per year. $1.50. The plantation company, with the full backing of the government, gave quotas to the chiefs to produce workers. With the chiefs being paid per head, they had to produce the required number of workers. A Firestone agent would be sent out to the villages to enforce the quotas. This process bordered on forced labor under the ILO Convention signed by the United States and Liberia in 1931. In less than a decade of the 1926 signing, Firestone had become the nation's highest employer with about 10,000 employees. That number increased to 25,000 from an estimated national population of 2.5 million people of Liberia in 1946. The number remained steady hovering around 20,000 in the 1950s. Insufficiency of rice production. The net effect of force and voluntary labor transfer to Firestone and Fernando Po dramatically reduced the production of rice, the nation's staple of food, especially among the indigenous at the time. The Liberian hinterland no longer had the, had the manpower even if subsistent to produce rice in quantities that would prevent importation. The problem became grave as more indigenous inhabitants moved into the wage sector, comprising of other rubber concessions, and later American, European concessions that mined the nation's iron ore. Firestone was importing rice now and supplying it to its employees at subsidized price, further attracting labor. By 1947-55, Liberia had become absolutely ceased to be self-sufficient in rice. The planting process had covered 200,000 acres in 1939, and that meant also a massive displacement of tribal communities away from their land. The planting agreement referred to only reserved tribal land that should be spared. Otherwise, it must be assumed that the tribal inhabitants were driven away though there is no evidence of any unrest arising out of the interaction. Land was acquired within tribal tradition by several means. A, conquest. B, voluntary submission to a superior lord. C, donation. D, abandonment or negligence. Or E, by purchase, which was a comparatively new custom. No record is available that any of these methods of acquisition transpired between the government and the chiefs. The Fernando Po scandal. Firestone's enthusiasm over the abundance of labor was justified by the Liberian government's guarantee that it would be directly involved in securing workers. What the government officials did not tell their business guests was that there was already in place a lucrative labor trade where top politicians, with the backing of President C.D.B. King, were exporting Liberian indigenous to Spanish cocoa plantations at Fernando Po, off the Central African coast. Despite the financial incentive package, Firestone had arranged for indigenous chiefs to disengage their able-bodied men. The tribal communities were also the pool that had to feed the Fernando Po trade. The reality was that the chiefs now had to cater to three categories of labor demand. The government in its Fernando Po operations, Firestone in its plantation activities, and the local needs for road construction and farm activities for district commissioners. In all of these activities, the average recruit was now making a voluntary decision to leave. The inequalities obtaining 
were passionately described by an English visitor when she said the Liberian government had without any notice pounds upon the travel cheese for hot and other taxes. They haven't had no time to prepare payment for these claims in kind. The officials sent up under escort of detachment of the Liberian Frontier Force not only confiscated their cattle and grain, but brought down as hostages numbers of their boys, quote unquote, who were relegated to work for no payment on the coffee estates for some time in Liberia and then shipped to Fernando Po, for which the Liberian government received five British pounds sterling per head from the Spanish government. And this became the concern of a Harvard University professor in the United States leading to worries at the U.S. State Department in Washington, D.C. Professor Raymond Leslie Buell said, Harvey Firestone was bound to run into demographic impossibilities from his statement that labor was inexhaustible in Liberia and that it should take 350,000 men to satisfy his plantation requirements. Buell estimated <laughs> that there were between 300 to 400,000 able-bodied men in Liberia and it was simply difficult to believe that Firestone would have been capable of placing Liberia's entire adult male population under its control. The validity of Boyle's questioning, the company's capability to satisfy the plantation labor needs, became evident in quiet Firestone complaints that Liberian government officials had begun to undermine his recruitment activities. The Fernando Po affair posed effective competition to the rubber company. The U.S. State Department rightfully expressed concern that Buell's campaign would open the U.S. government to criticism that it was supporting forced labor to help an American investment at the expense of the indigenous victims of an inhumane system of governance in Liberia. The State Department communication to the King government on the labor malpractices was therefore intended to also demonstrate to the world that the United States was not a party and could not condone such conduct. The Americans also had to get out of defensive mode over the labor crisis when President King's defeated opponent in the 1927 elections published in the Baltimore newspaper that the King government was involved in slavery and forced labor. Thomas Faulkner, who lost the presidential election to President King, reported in a newspaper in the United States that top officials of the government were particularly shipping Liberians against their will to Fernando Po. With this local revelation, Washington intensified efforts for an international investigation. The result was that the League of Nations set up a commission of inquiry headed by a British, Cotball Christie, and included President Arthur Barclay, former President Arthur Barclay for the Liberian government, and a black American called Charles Johnson. The 1930 commission reported that slavery did not exist in Liberia as defined by the anti-slavery convention, but the compulsory method of recruiting people for dispatch to the Fernando Po plantations was associated with slavery. The commission said President King, his vice president Alan Yancey, and other officials were receiving $45 for each of the indigenous boys, as they call them, exported to Fernando Po. And the soldiers of the LFF were used to catch, quote unquote, these boys. To catch these boys. The Christie report concluded further that Liberian government officials abused their office in using the Liberian army, the LFF, to recruit workers, and that the government was using forced labor practices to recruit workers also for the Firestone Plantation Company. The Christie Commission recommended that the Liberian government immediately eradicate the system of pawning human beings and domestic slavery and stop the export of labor to Fernando Poe 
or any other place. A controversial issue bordering on sovereignty was a proposal that Americans be sent to Liberia to serve as district commissioners and other administrative officers in the hinterland. That plus the proposal on encouraging black Americans to Liberia raised concerns obviously among the American Liberians. The Liberian Frontier Force heavy-handed involvement was also investigated by the League of Nations Commission. The LFF under British or American commanders had not only been used to brutally put down tribal uprisings, but also intimidate and coerce the rural people into a permanent structure of unquestionable loyalty. The Christie report requested that the administration should impose a code of stringent discipline among the officers and soldiers. Ladies and gentlemen, we have intentionally used the Firestone Agreement and its relevant issues as a case study, not aimed at presenting Firestone as some boogeyman or demon, but only to explain how at various times our Liberian elitist policy of ties and cultural subjugation can suffocate the entirety of the population in discrimination. The era of Tubmanism. Under the superstructure of the grand politics of the grand old true party and its opponents and the deeds of William V. S. Tubman Sr., 18th President of the Republic of Liberia, described by some as the benevolent dictator, I must do my analysis within the setting of my childhood and youth story. Like many others today on the Liberian political scene, I was born in the Tottenham administration precisely on February 11. An interesting date. February 11, 1953. That date over the years have accumulated some symbolism of some sort, the value of which is left with the mind explorer. Besides it being Armed Forces Day, a national holiday in Liberia, when the gruesome Liberia Frontier Force was transformed into the Armed Forces of Liberia, bringing comparable relief to many, that day signifies a more significant movement of African freedom. It is the day Nelson Mandela saw freedom after 26 years of hard labor in some South African jail. Since 1991 when he was freed, I've always focused on the exploits and suffering of Mandela every time my birthday has come. That day also constantly reminds me of the decision of my parents to send their first three sons to Lofra County, our paternal home. Though I did not understand the motive at the time when people were sending their children to Monrovia from the rural areas, my father was doing the reverse. I would later realize that it would be the root of my preparation to meet the grave chance and challenges of the life ahead. Vamuya Nkrumah, my father, wanted to expose his children to the land of his nativity, to the culture that guided his lineage and heritage. He had come to Monrovia himself from the Kwaru Boni Madingo chiefdom, now a district in Lufa County. Elders, led by Clan Chief Mwabinya Fofana a few years ago, presented to me his, his, a historical account of Tusu, my father's hometown, built some 420 years ago. The elders also included in their presentation the history of the Kumar family in Tusu, descending from Fakwali Kumba, Fakwali Daba, Jamajan Kwali Dumbuya, <laughs> who was part of the administration of the ancient West African Empire of Songhe. The chiefs explained that my father's grandfather, Omen Lansana, 
was a leading resistant warrior that constantly moved along the Makoya River in northern Lofa, leading protective forces against suspecting encroachers from the French control gaining territory at the time. The Kumars were not the only Madinos involved in the preservation of northern Lofa. They were led by great Madingo chiefs like Vafle Kwali Kamara and Bongo Moibe Kamara, who along with the famous Loma chief Digay Koba, placed northern Lofa under the administrative jurisdiction of the Monrovia government in 1916 at a conference also attended by the French. President Daniel Howard decorated the three chiefs with a silver medal of honor and commissioned them the first Parama chiefs of the Republic of Liberia. Two Madingos and one Loma. From this background of my father's womb, I could understand why the late Liberian prolific historian and Attorney General of Liberia, C. Abaye Mikanga, took special interest in my father and took him to live at his Camp Johnson Road residence in Monrovia. Kanga, who wrote a great deal about traditional life in Liberia, was a so-called Congo man, but not a miracle Liberian. The Congo people were those who were rescued from slave ships heading from the Congo region in Central Africa and subsequently brought to Liberia as free people. They assimilated over a period of time into American Liberian culture, and today the two references are synonymous. Kanga, like Igor Wilman Blani, actively advocated for the integration of all sectors of the Liberian population. The background of this young Madingo Muslim friend. My father, Ramuya Krumar, appeal, appeared to have been really relevant in the continuous research Abai Mikanga conducted into the customs and mores of indigenous Liberia, including the rich Lofa hinterland. By the time my brothers and I returned from the Madingo town of Kuluka in the Vanyama district and the Badi town of Sevelahu, in the Kuala Lumpur district in the early 1960s. Our father had obtained his commission and gone to the Republic of Egypt to pursue a degree in linguistics and international studies. Our initiation into Madingo and Bandi culture exposed us to the discipline of farming, hunting, and the culture of respect for elders and peers. Before and after my father's visit to Egypt, he had always insisted that we speak to him in Madingo and not English, no matter how hard the topic was, even though he spoke to us in English. It was after my return from Lofa that I got to know, for example, that dance and performing artist instruments had specific sounds. And that if you were bandy, for example, a true and genuine bandy, you ought to know what the samba will produce, what the tandengi, the drum on the arm, will produce and what the sasa will produce. So during the elections, I remember a couple of years ago, I asked a bunny man, Dr. Poto, whether he knew the official traditional sounds of the tanengi, the samba, and the sasa. He sat there for five minutes, blank. And mute. He said, what are the sounds? I said, the tanengi, the drum under the, the arm, if you beat it, you hear tanengi, don't, 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 that. The drums between your legs, if you beat it, you hear samani patakurama, and the sasa in your hand, 
Can you play? You hear Sir Gwai Bussell and Mandali. They meant something. For each of the Liberian tribes is a reservoir of unique and special culture, wisdom, knowledge, lineage, and heritage. And therefore, their exposure to any of the tribes is an added education. It's an added exposure to what Liberian culture is. My mother, Maya Seba, which is the female name for Sayon, spoke Bopolupele, in whom, along with Vi and Loma, when she wanted to keep things confidential. Her mother and maternal grandparents, Kwebwe and Kopo, were Loma people who had migrated from Lofa to the vicinity of Clearance Land in Montserrat County where they formed the village of Kwebwe Town. A number of Maya Seba's aunts were from Kipman County, while she herself hailed directly from Bami County. Her father, my grandfather Abdullah Sayon, was an infinite source of Liberian history. Before he died in 1976, at the age of 116, his ancestor was Kumasi Sayon the religious companion and cousin of King Sao Boso, we have discussed earlier. This background, I believe, inspired my mother to become an untiring market woman in Monrovia along with Mami Baker, struggling to provide for her children when my father was in Egypt. Every morning, when we were on vacation from school, I accompanied her to sell her rice and later slippers, lapas, and towels. We developed a discipline of hard work and self-sufficiency as my brothers, sister, and I branched off into selling cold water on the streets of Monrovia, boiled eggs, kerosene, or wood at the house. That early entrepreneurship helped us survive in Then came the big shock in my early teenage, which will impact my adult character and resolve. Following his college graduation and some period of work in Egypt, my father dispatched a letter to my mother in Monrovia that by the grace of God, he will soon take up the position of, of Liberia's ambassador to Egypt. He had been recommended to President Tubman by the leader Haji Vamuyan Sharif and Haji Vamuyan Kony. That meant we all had to move to Egypt and we're happy. I remember my brothers and sister and I danced the whole week. At City Beking Elementary School in Monrovia, our drop in the studies was quickly noticed by our teachers and principal, Mrs. Collins, Mrs. Russell, the mother of Willard Russell, Mrs. T.D. T.D. Spears Stewart, Mr. Robert Stewart, Mr. Jacob Kolinke, and one Mrs. Verdia. I don't know whether she's related to the chairman here. But she was a good teacher. She was my third grade teacher. I had gotten a quick promotion from second grade on a Jacob Kolinke to go to the third grade only after two months in the second grade. And I passed to the fourth grade as a deuce in Mrs. Verger's class. But our euphoria as my father's children was short-lived. For my mother soon received a confidential letter from my father in Egypt that President Tutman was no longer considering him to serve as ambassador because someone at the embassy had written Tutman to say my father was a so-called countryman and had strong links with the socialist cadres of President Gamma Abdul Nasser of Egypt. It is from there that 
all of what I had learned from my cultural ep expeditions in Lofa plus more had to come into play for me to understand the basis of this big disappointment in my youthful life. What is this country, mayor, and socialist business? My mother went to the late Councillor McDonough Perry, a friend of my father's, and former Secretary of State Momolu Dukle, her cousin, to find out about these issues. Nothing has ever happened until the return of my father to Monrovia several years later. President Tutman hired him in the language department along with the late Kekura Putu at the executive mansion. Our father, of course, went on to do other things as a teacher and an apprenticeship lawyer. But important, he was now faced with explaining to his children, us, particularly me, what was the implication of this countryman labeling what was it all about? As I grew up in junior and senior high school, my father simply told me to look around, compare and contrast people's behavior, and read any and everything that comes your way. Read the books written by Councillor Abayo Mikanga and all other books on Liberian history. Read about capitalism, socialism, communism, the biographies and autobiographies of world leaders. Read the entire Quran and the Bible. Read about the seven major religions of the world. And read the writings of philosoph and philosophies of St. Thomas Aquinas, Voltaire, Voltaire, and Omar Khayyam. I tried following the old man's advice and realized the impact of the history I have endeavored to narrate earlier here today. I look up and saw Tutman and remember that he did not appoint my father as ambassador for a certain reason. No one ambassador, H.B. Farmula Sr., had been arrested and brought home about the same time my father was being rejected. Was there really a division among the people? My father said, look at the list of officials from the founding of the Republic to this Tutman period. Besides Mamalu Dukle, who once served as Secretary of State, and was quickly replaced with J. Rudolph Grimes, what other name you see that does not sound like a Western name? My maternal grandfather, Abdullah Sanyo, who had been living since the 1860s, clarified a lot the written history I carried to him. Many times giving me first hand accounts of events that included the David Coleman episode, the Barclay Tottenham rivalry, and what happened to Billy Horace and the others. The Torba administration. The liberation of Africa and apartheid in South Africa was a daily reading preoccupation of my father. And that habit became infectious. That's how I found out in my senior year at St. Patrick's High School here in Monrovia that Liberian registered thinkers were carrying coon from the then Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, in violation of United Nations sanctions against the Ian e. Smith white minority regime. It was now the administration of President William R. Talbot who had succeeded Tutman following the latter's death in 1971. Talbot, I thought, was indeed active and vocal against the remaining vestiges of colonialism and minority rule in Africa. The president was playing host to liberation leaders nearly every month. It therefore appeared as a contradiction that the same Talbot was condoning the violation of UN sanctions on Rhodesia, whose minority white leadership was challenging the international system. I decided that it had, the matter had to be dealt with publicly. I detailed 
the Rhodesia Kroom affair and challenged the government to justify its position. It became clear to me in subsequent days that the government actually was unaware of the transaction showing how callously the management of Liberia's maritime affairs was being managed. The statement that I made as president of the Monrovia Highway Council, a program held at the University of Liberia Auditorium with Kenneth Bess as our guest speaker. That statement was carried as banner headline in the popular Star newspaper. Courtesy of the late ace journalist Rufus Dapper, a graduate of St. Patrick's. That was 1973, the month of August. Dapper usually published articles from the St. Patrick's student magazine, The Echoes, edited by my friend Maurice Duclos. In a few weeks after my Rhodesia speech, Duclos and I were called to the Ministry of Information and hired the same day. I went to the Press Bureau, now the Liberia News Agency, under Johnny McLean and Duclos went to the Public Affairs. With the proximity of St. Patrick's to the University of Liberia campus, I was regularly on that campus from 1971 when students from rural Liberia began contemplating a student political party at the university. By the end of the year, the, pres the first president of the Student Unification Party, by the end of the year, Frederick Gobawali from Lufa County had been unanimously elected as the first president of the Student Unification Party almost entirely consisting of indigenous Liberians. The rival Student Democratic Party emerged largely consisting of American Liberian students. With my late and cherished brother Lassana Kumar serving as Vice President of the Student Council of the SUPTK, I was virtually participating in the University of Liberia campus politics before my enrollment in 1974. By the time Dr. Tobana Tipota and his colleagues were endeavoring to penetrate the ranks of the Student Unification Party, recruiting membership for the Movement of Justice in Africa, Moja, I was on my way out. <laughs> I hear Buya laughing. <laughs> he was there too. Before then, we were focused as a group on campus politics the rise of student groups, as well as certain professors who were becoming endangered species. When the university administration summarily dismissed key faculty members for what was described as teaching foreign ideology and inciting students against the government, the soup led student council delegation headed by Council President Joseph Dunkwan issued a demand for the reinstatement of Professor Stipote Mayor Anthony Brown Sherman and several others. As students got increasingly restless on campus, Tarbo sent the chairman of the board of trustees, who happened to have been the speaker of the House of Representatives, the Honorable Richard Herrings, to meet with us. <coughs> Buya was also in that committee. <laughs> the board, the board of trustees was a who's who listing of the Liberian government. It included Vice President James Green and our illustrious Senator Frank Talbot, former Treasury Secretary William E. Dennis Sr. They quickly told us that President Talbot, the commander in chief and head of state of this nation, could not accept an ultimatum from irresponsible students like us, and that we, in fact, were not party to the faculty contract. Hmm? As spokesman of the group, I consulted and later told Speaker Hennings that though we did not sign the faculty contract, we were necessarily relevant as students. Then I asked all of them, which one of the board members had any of their children at the university at the time? There was complete silence because none of them had their children there. Either they have gone to the States or somewhere else. And the meeting was quickly adjourned. 
President Tarver, we'll learn later, was disappointed with the handling of the crisis and in turn issued his own ultimatum <laughs> to the board members to quickly resolve the issue. And that's how the matter came to a close, with the reinstatement of the professors, <laughs> except for a couple of them who were already taking their severance pay. I went shortly afterwards on the ground with my writing on political and other issues with the pen name <laughs> Pro Bono Publico for the good of the public. My fellow student in Maya Buya, who knew the hidden identity, cautioned me seriously to be careful and advised I was to realize the value of later on. The Minister of Information, my employer as a cadet, strangely never discovered the author behind the articles. Meanwhile, the drama of the expectation soon erupted on the Talbot, whose smooth assumption of office gave evidently false impressions of political stability. A politician, businessman, a Baptist preacher, Tawa introduced some changes in the political modules vivendi upon assuming office as president. He sent signals that although he was a prominent member of the country's minority class, which had ruled since independence in 1847, he was prepared to respond to the yearning for reform. He attempted loosening the grip of the ruling Truwe party, threw away the cassock that wrapped around the belly, tail coat, and top hat. He dislodged the elitist Masonic craft from politics and preached a doctrine of self-reliance and democracy. His presidential aircraft done the inscription Speedy One, with himself being called Speedy, supposedly for his impatience in achieving his reform programs. Vice President Ben Warner, a regular listener to my periodic radio commentaries on ERBC, requested that I work with him as press secretary and research attaché. As bishop of the Methodist Church of Liberia, Warner was known as a critic of bad government policies and ills of the society. Thomas said he had a dream following the death of his first vice president, James Green. And God instructed him to select Benny Warner, who promised to us the crooks out of the government in a speech at his inauguration. As his stance afterwards got mitigated with time in the government, I became wary and requested that I search for secondment at the Liberia Broadcasting System in the news department. The managing director of LBS, called the Liberia Broadcasting Corporation at the time, the late Timothy Clyde Williams, got panicky and demanded that I bring what he called a letter of clearance before he could employ me. What? This was shocking to me, a letter of clearance as if I had committed a crime, but I did something. I wrote a small letter and gave it to a personal friend of mine to present it to President Talbot, accusing the president of suppressing my civil liberties and the right to a livelihood. I was surprised when he quickly invited me to identify the instance of violation of my rights. I told him the Clarence story and he sent for Mr. Williams to let him know that his government was not in the business of requesting for clearance. That's how I became director of news and public affairs. I just wanted a simple employment there. At, L <laughs> At LBS, I presented television commentary after the news in which I thought it was an opportunity to try giving an independent perspective on issues. My last commentary <laughs> was the one given on the outcome of the 1979 
has a, has a first summit conference of the Organization of African Unity. The Togo government's account of how nearly $200 million was used to host the 1979 OAU conference became a matter of public debate. Foreign Minister Cecil Dennis, chairman of the conference implementation committee, was having difficulty explaining how the money was used amidst widespread rumors that the amount was a victim of corruption. From workers on the site to a cross-section of the population, there were complaints about how the money was used. Threatening to undermine the government's plan to exploit the super political leadership of Africa. Finance Minister James Phillips Jr. and his staff became subject of a financial scandal hovering over a leased hotel boat brought in to accommodate OAU guests. The boat contract was officially put at $2.2 million, an amount said to have been inflicted by government officials. Phillips resigned, later denying any wrongdoing, but wanted to maintain his integrity. Though President Toba took on the prestigious mantle of current chairman of the OAU, the event left a bitter taste over accusations of mass corruption among the Liberian government organizers. After commenting on the political success of the occasion in my commentary that evening, I called for the setting up of a financial committee that would audit the OAU committee, headed by the foreign minister and including finance minister James T. Phillips and other officials. At the end of the broadcast that evening, something interesting happened. As I tried getting into my vehicle, I was invited by a uniformed officer of the Special Security Service of the Executive Mansion, who said I was needed to pick up a news item at the Executive Mansion. We used his vehicle. He headed directly to the rear of the mansion to a decrepit little building which turned out to be a temporary detention center for security officers at the mansion. He called on two soldiers in the dark, whispered something to them, and then they unlocked the building and shoved me in. That is the night, ladies and gentlemen, I met the man without knowing he would have led the group that overthrew President Talbot. As I stood in a cell of about 10 persons, dumbfounded, I asked for the toilet. <laughs> and all the other inmates started laughing. You have to pay for your margarine cup, my man. I heard someone saying, margarine cup for what? Another surprise. I heard the voice of a friend the late Dexter Tyler, who asked whether that was a Haji Kruman. He then identified himself to my utter surprise, explaining to me he had been jailed for losing his pistol assigned by the SSS. As I explained my circumstances, Dexter expressed surprise and said he didn't believe I would spend the night. I then got close to the cracked door, several cracks on the door, to avoid the smell of the stench in the executive mansion cell. Then I overheard at least three passers by, two of them speaking Loma. They were soldiers. I then called on them to come at which time I explained my plight, still behind the cracked door. They spoke English and said they had no authority to release me. Then the third soldier quickly intervened and said he knew me. He said he knew me from television newscasting. 
I was released a few minutes past midnight. I never got to know who ordered my incarceration. I went to an executive mansion. I went to Benny Warner's office. As they say in Liberia, I couldn't get any hair or tail. Neither did I know who was the soldier that released me. At least not until I was called to the executive mansion one morning a year later to meet the leader of the coup along with other members of the People's Redemption Council. Doe quickly reminded me about that night and said he was a soldier that had me released. By the end of 1979, I had been transferred to the Ministry of Information and appointed assistant minister for public affairs following the incident behind the mansion. I came to the conclusion that my regular access to television was not in the interest of the administration, at least not in the eyes of those who surrounded President Talbot. And that is when I again realized that the political system was still infested with zealots of the old order despite the apparent moves by Talbot to introduce reforms. Let me give you an interesting anecdote to illustrate my point. You may not believe this. One morning I was invited by a very important official of the Talbot government. He was also a confidant of the president. He said, <clears throat> Assistant Minister Haji Kruman said, Yes, sir. Uh, you know, President Talbot considers you as one of his precious jewels. I said, Perhaps. He said, But this name, Al Haji. You don't have any other name? <laughs> I said, Oh, my name is Al Haji G. V. Kroma. He said, What does G stand for? George? I said, No, Gassim. He said, What's about a V? I said, Vamuya. He said, hmm. You know, I thought you were some old man when I heard this Alhaji thing. But the thing is, with the kind of sensitive position you are in now as a young man, you don't think this Alhaji may create some kind of problem? I said, what do you suggest? He said, well, maybe you can use Abraham. Because that cuts both ways. I said, Abraham, I should be mean by you. <laughs> re mean by you, he said. He said, yeah, not bad. I said, OK. I'll reply you, sir. Incidentally, I, re I had received an invitation to serve as the guest speaker of the Wilson High School at the City Hall. And my topic was, should I change the name Ahaji? And I told the audience that I had been summoned to the executive mansion and a very important minister, official of government, confident of the president, was embarrassed and uncomfortable with the name Al-Haji. And I promised to answer him. So here goes the answer. Mr. Official, from the time I knew myself as a baby, I knew Al-Haji. That name and I we are taken care of 
for several years by my poor market woman mother. Alhaji and I, who went to see the Bikin school, <laughs> were taught by Mrs. Vredia and others. We went to junior high school, Assemblies of God Mission School, AGM, Alhaji and I. We joined the Baba Quest team with Coleman, and we contested against many high schools here. We had to memorize most parts of the Bible. Alhaji and I. And that's why people are surprised when I start to quote from various books in the Bible. So where are you, Muslim or Christian? Alhaji and I. Then we went to St. Patrick's High School. Suffered, studied, piano light. Sometimes we couldn't eat. That little Alhaji and I. Then we went through the University of Liberia. Hiding here, there, and yonder. Some of our classmates working at the National Bureau of Investigation, MPI, carrying information on us. Little Alhaji and I studied and graduated bachelor degree in economics. Worked in various places. Went over up country to assignments, etc., with the mosquitoes. Those mosquitoes bit Alhaji and I in the forest, Grand Gita, throughout the southeastern part of our country. Now, you have given me this little assistant minister job. I should betray Alhaji. If together we can go through all of these things, I betray Alhaji. How sure are you that I will not betray you and President Talbot? I'm sorry, Minister, even after I die, I shall continue to carry al Haji name. The minister I was told later was so scared because someone called and said, it looked like this boy is about to call an in yet. But I never called his name. And later on, he called me to his office he said, please forgive me. I said, I ask God to forgive you. And stay, stay far away from President Talbot. Because you're going to destroy him. So was the time. Indeed, it was now 1980. And the high energy crusade for reform had President Talbot in more trouble than when he started. He was caught between the demands of the conservative diehards he inherited, but half heartedly encouraged, and the rebellious intellectuals and street politicians he involuntarily motivated. The latter wanted power in the name of the people, while the others felt the minority regime hegemony was fading. In the process, the nation was left in economic hotspot, general insecurity, and repulsive social practices. The citizenry was now stranded in a vehicle without brakes. In the early morning hours of April 12, while imprisoned, opponents faced threats of physical elimination. A group of 17 young soldiers climatically stepped in, and Talbot was left a fatal victim. The nation had indeed begun a rough course of rebirth in its old age toppling the regime. The uncertainty that swallowed up the nation 
on the eve of the military takeover had an ironic twist. People confusingly speculated some sort of coup was in the making. But the military was hardly the focus. The police force had become notoriously powerful from their brusque behavior during the 1979 rights demonstrations. Their morale, as it is called, was high and they appeared unconquerable. Justice Minister Joseph Chesson was out on radio assuring President Talbot that everything was under control and the president should sleep. The hesitant stance of the army in the protests painted them powerless and untrustworthy in the sight of the establishment. The public was understandably swayed by the portrayal, by that portrayal, not realizing the refusal of the soldiers to stop the crowd on that day was more an act of solidarity with the rioters and that weakness. Besides, President Talbot seemed to have galvanized his control over the armed forces by placing his aviator cousin, Lieutenant General Franklin Smith, as Chief of Staff of the Armed Forces of Liberia. When the soldiers finally struck on the night of April 12, 1980, few could honestly claim they knew that the enlisted men could have actually tried and succeeded. The military surprised the public when the names of several Talbot ministers were announced among the new officials, the cabinet. The new regime retained Talbot's public works minister, Gabriel Tucker, health minister, Kate Bryant, and minister, Lucini Donzo, of the Action for Development and Progress, later renamed Minister of Rural Development. The soldiers admired these officials, particularly Tucker, who they said was only concerned with national development and was not corrupt. The PRC government was organized shortly following the overthrow. My understanding is that on that night, the first choice for head of state was not Samuel K. Do. I was told by PRC senior member, the late Abraham Colley, that when the soldiers overthrew the government, they had a small meeting on one of the floors of the executive mansion, even before they could go to release Barkers, Matthews, Oscar, Queer, Chair Chico, and the rest, George Bowling. And they asked each other. So gentlemen, the mission is accomplished. What is it now that we're going to do? Somebody said, where is the vice president, Benny Warner? Then Abraham Colley said, he told me, he said, oh, we carry the man to Robert's feet. He's not in the country. Then Thomas Wesson said, after certain instances of argument, that well then, let us take it over. And I will serve as head of state because I'm supposed to be commissioned second lieutenant. Then Kuwankwa said, you're supposed to be, but you have not been commissioned. So we have to look at the highest person here, which happened to have been Master Sergeant Samuel Kahn. And Wesson said he would not accept that. Then they all agreed that, okay, we have to carry on because 
You don't know what the soldiers are doing outside there. And some of the politicians are still in jail. So for the, for the moment, we will accept Samuel Canyon Do as our acting head of state. So Western was said to have reluctantly agreed. Before then, the dispatch, Kumba, Larry Botti, and others to free the inmates of the post stockade. Three individuals from jail got together to read a statement that was read by Samuel Kanyondo, according to what Samuel Kanyondo told me. Oscar Kuya, Marcus Matthews, and Chia Chiku. We all woke up that morning to the ruffling sound on the microphone between four and five with a voice. Play it. Play it. Play it. That was the anthem. And then Doe came on. We didn't know who was that. And he said President Torba had been overthrown for rampant corruption. And that the People's Redemption Council was now in control. Wow. We have seen the agitation, we have seen the instability. We have speculated maybe that something would go wrong. But now this was the reality. For me, I didn't really believe that this could have happened. But we felt that these soldiers, unknown soldiers, were doing the work of bigger officers. Until we heard the coup was in the coup from Samuel K. Do saying, no non-commissioned officer should take orders from any commissioned officer. I think that was a real coup. Because some of these generals and colonels have been carrying these little soldiers, using them as watchmen, cook, drivers, all kinds of things. And you can imagine what the announcement did. The general quickly became the corporal. They overthrew their big shots, military big shots. I was sitting at my house that morning. Didn't know what to make of the next step. I just saw this vehicle rushing in my yard. I almost collapsed. Because right in front of my yard, we had a little Volkswagen there from the Liberian News Agency. But that was not a problem. It had written on it, Bentor. <laughs> and those soldiers had just killed the president from Bentor. That was only one gate to get out of the yard. Then we tried to look for the key for the Volkswagen. They said the key was lost. What are we going to do with a big Bentor written on the Volkswagen? And then this vehicle was coming. With soldiers pointing guns out of the window. That was Saturday afternoon. I was assistant minister then. The government had inherited me from the tribal government. I saw this master sergeant Cut down, jump out of the vehicle. Ten of them in that small vehicle rushed to me. I said, what happened? I locked the door behind me with my family in there. He said, you don't remember me? I said, you look familiar. 
become Sergeant Ford. You forgotten? I was working at the vice president's office when you were there and I asked you to give me a letter of recommendation to the chief of staff to promote me. He said, you wrote that letter and that's the rank I have today. I said, so what you came for? <laughs> I want to know. He said, they said, we'll carry you to the mansion. For what? He said, all your friends there. <laughs> I said, who are my friends? Because I had a big announcement on the radio that they were collecting people. So I called my minister, Johnny McLean. I said, Johnny? He said, yes. I said, where are you? He said, I'm still at the house, oh. I said, but there's an announcement ahead that all ministers, and that ministers should go. He said, that all of us, I said, no, I'm an assistant minister. <laughs> because I remember when I was assistant minister with Mr. McLean as a minister. He went to a cabinet meeting one day and returned and called a senior staff meeting. He said, at that meeting there was uh, the late Honorable Bai T. Moore, Deputy Minister. Um, I was there as Assistant Minister for Public Affairs and other officials, other Assistant Ministers. He said, President Toba is angry. He said, this a, a stream of anonymous leaflets going around here and we have said nothing about it at the Ministry of Information. No denial. These leaflets condemning the government and we know it's from PPP or Moja. So Minister McLean said, this is what we have to do, so we have to put a very strong press release together to condemn this leaflet. So Assistant Minister Kromar said, yes, sir. You need to put it together. <laughs> I said, did you, have you seen this leaflet before going to the mansion? He said, no. I said, if you as Minister of Information had not seen this leaflet, what is the possibility that thousands of people had not seen it? You cannot condemn this, letter, this newsletter or leaflet on the radio without mentioning what the leaflet said, our President, President uh, Talbot. So this is a strategy by the authors of this leaflet to promote their message. Because at the moment, the government will be considered as a liar and the authors will be considered as the underdog because the government is losing integrity. So I do not believe that it will be useful. It will be contrapositive for us to put out the condemnation. Then he told me, okay, you know what? When you become a minister, you can take that decision. I'm writing my condemnation. So on this morning, when they were calling for the ministers, and he said, well, I should go. I said, no, I'm an assistant minister. When I go to the mansion, I saw George Bowley, Minister of State for Presidential Affairs. He said, the President wants to see you. I said, from where? That's when, when we entered, we saw the senior members of the PRC. That's when he said, you remember me, Kromar? I said, no, sir. So I'm the one who freed you from that small jail behind the mansion there that night. 
I say it had to be you because how did you get to know I was the one? Then Watson said, Kroma, say yes, sir. What are you doing? You're not writing enough out of the PRC. You have to one minister then. That's when I panic. <laughs> because all around me, <laughs> it was a very interesting scene. I saw some empty scalp cartoons in the corner. And everybody had on goggles, shades. <laughs> I said, they just picking up from my house. What do you want me to say? He said, you should understand the revolution. Then those say yes. And you don't want you to get thrown after the news? But we dare you. Bring some of our commentary to say something bad about us. So I was sent back to the Ministry of Information. And it was tough. Because all the PRC members wanted to be covered. And we just had two television cameras. And ten people who called me and said, send me one team. It was difficult. So I said, well, the only two cameras we got at the executive mansion. He said, oh, so you think we're the president do? Over to the government. So we face these kinds of things. Until eventually things calm down. The work was so intense that I asked the PRC that I had to go because I graduated from college 77. It was now 1980. I had applied to the American University to do a graduate program in communication. So I asked the PRC to give me a leave of absence. And so Weston said, I told you, these are the remnants of that government. They may want to leave and go help the people that are rich. Don't say you're not reaching anything. Let them go. When I got to the United States, I started my program, I used to talk to Doe on the phone on the weekend. I was monitoring things. Jericho and I had worked closely together also when I was assistant minister of information. One day, when head of state Doe called, he said, Kroma, something happening here. I said, what is that? He said, these people think I'm a chicken. Every day they want to kill me. Yeah, what's that? And uh, here is war. Forgot the names of the others. And the old millionaire Oscar Kuya. They want to overthrow the government. He said, but I'm waiting for Tipote. You got your hands out too. I say to him, are you sure? This thing has just started. That was 1981. So soon, we have started talking about somebody plotting. You should let the rule of law and the due process take its course. He said, the people are going on trial. I said, you'll be very careful with each other. Because if you're relying on your maturity, sense of maturity, the next thing I heard, the men had been executed. That was very scary. 
When I returned home, 1982, I went to visit Jeraku Wampa. He said, come on, go talk to your friend. Because we planned to go back to the barracks. We planned to go back to the barracks after the elections. But some people pushing him. Some people pushing him to want to run. I said, but he's your best friend. You people were together. Vis-a-vis -vis the others. We're saying, we're saying the others who are executed. Now you split up. He said, I don't know. But there are people around him. So we all agreed that we will meet that Sunday morning at the mansion. So that we could talk this over and find out what was happening. 10 o'clock, said we should meet. Do I agree? Kuangba agreed. When I got there at 9.45, Thomas Kuwampa was coming down, descending the stairs. I said, what happened? He said, go ask your man. I said, who Kuwampa said, go ask your man? Who going to go upstairs there? <laughs> I found out from those who were around there that head of state do I call a meeting and announced the transfer of General Kuwampa to the Cabinet Building as Secretary General of the People's Redemption Council. And I quickly appointed General Morris Zizi as the next commanding general. Kuwampa obviously was not pleased, but at that point, never openly refused. In short, that led to a serious schism within the PRC. In the end, General Kuwampa had to leave, flee. Then we had the Nima raid involving Samuel Doki took place and that some people were killed, relatives of Charles Julu. Sometime later, I was dismissed as Assistant Minister of Information. I spent only three months, I'm sorry, as Minister of Information. I had come after 82 serve as Director General of the Library of Broadcasting System, and then later on appointed as Minister. I spent only three months at the Ministry. That was one of the most critical and dangerous moments. It was a time that Vice Head of State Podia, Eva Sawyer, and a number of people had been jailed. General Gray D. Allison, Minister of Defense, when the students started protesting against the arrest of Sawyer, ordered the movement of the soldiers onto the campus of the university. And I saw rattans in the hands of the soldiers besides their guns. Because there was a casket being displayed right at the mouth of the University of Liberia campus. By the students saying that that was the casket of Doe. So the soldiers ran after them onto the campus. That night, we heard that some shooting had taken place on the campus and that some people had been killed. 
I was Minister of Information. Man crying in the night. We have sent our reporters to the various hospitals and clinics to find out the situation, whether people have been killed or wounded. I called my colleague in the cabinet, Minister of Health, Mata Sandolo Bele, to give me up to date report on what was happening at the hospitals and clinics. And I told her, please be honest to me. Has anybody been killed? And she said, not to her recollection of any information. So about 11 o'clock, I was still at the office. Because this was a great day in the history of Liberia. Help us get So I called head of state Doe. I said, excuse me, sir. Have you got any information that anybody has been killed? He said, no. We don't follow this rumor that's going around town. Whole minister like you. I said, no, I'm asking you. I'm not making a statement. You are the head of state. I want to know because you are privy to all important information. And the soldiers went there. So I want to know, frankly. Was anybody killed? He said, no. I said, you sure? He said, yes. I said, okay. So I decided to do something the next day. <laughs> I wrote a press release. And I asked any member of the public who is missing a relative should come forward to the Ministry of Information with a photograph of the missing person. I put on the head and gave the Kenneth Best to publish it in the Observer newspaper and other newspapers. Then, who was it? Bernard Blamo, the Minister of State at the time. And he called. He said, the President, I want to see you. When I came, I could see the anger and the tension in the room. Kruma, what kind of man are you? Call you say educated man. You go put that kind of report on the head. I said, but didn't I ask you last night whether anybody was killed? He said, I'm not talking about that. You know these Liberian people here, they can lie. Somebody will come and say, I said, but then we will have to investigate what they say. I ask you, and you said you are sure of yourself. So I feel no remorse upon the announcement here. Justice Minister Jenkins Scott called me and said, the American embassy called him and said that was the best decision taken under the premises. He said, Bob, my man, we got to worry. I said, why? He said, suppose the police start coming. Showing pictures of their lost relatives. What are we going to do? I said, the president told me nobody died. Then, the first person came forward. <laughs> I don't know where he was working. But they had an office at the old executive mansion down here. I don't know what organization was there. Buya, what organization was there? Yeah, some kind of commission there. Investment, well, investment commission. This man came forward, he said, I have a niece who has been killed on campus. She has been killed on campus. She's a daughter of Mr. Warimi. I said, what's the picture? He brought the picture. I said, where is Mr. Warimi? He said, he's at home. Hmm. It reminded me of something I helped years. I'll tell you later. So, I didn't tell do. I put an announcement here. I said, this miss, I forgot his name. I said he has come forward to say that his niece has been killed on the campus. And she's missing since two, three days now. But he's found out that she was missing. It went on the news, headline. In a few hours, 
I saw Mr. Waribi himself. He brought his daughter to the Ministry of Information. And you know the big words, one of the big words those days was diabolical. Every small thing I have in diabolical. Mr. Minister? Say yes, sir. What kind of diabolical news lie is this? You have a daughter here? Then don't call me. He said, come on, God will bless you. I said, thank you, sir. You see the lie you're talking about? Nobody came forward after that. Then I said, maybe the people have gotten scared. So I said, don't come to me. Go to the newspapers. Go to Kenneth Bess and other people. Go to the Red Cross. Do it quietly. Just carry your picture. Up to today's date, I'm aware of no picture that came. That was one instance. Minister of Information. How was I dismissed? I was commissioning Mr. Gene Isia as Minister Counselor at the Liberian Embassy in Tel Aviv, Israel. And we're on the verge of elections in the country. And I made a statement during that commissioning ceremony. I said, in these elections that are coming, the Liberian people will no longer accept a one-party state. And will never accept dictatorship. We will never allow this country to be derailed again into non-democratic patterns. That was it. The following day, the whole political clique descended upon door. You heard from our statement, Chief? What did he say? He said, your dictatorship, what you brought here, it will stay right here with you. Don't say, I hear it. Come on, say it. In the next 30 minutes, I was whisked off, invited to the executive mansion. Come on, you don't want to cussing me on the radio? I said, no, sir. I will cuss you. You calling me dictator? I said, no, I will repeat what I said. And I repeated. He said, but people told me different things, but you shouldn't have used the word dictator because every time people say military, that dictatorship they can think about. So some people think you're talking about me. I say, Mr. Head of State, I'm sorry. You are advocating for democracy by bringing the elections. I'm equally advocating for that democracy by talking against those things that will undermine democracy. So we're saying the same thing, and that's my responsibility. And that is my obligation. I remember Finance Minister Gao Jun was sitting there. And I think Minister Blamo. He had called those two ministers. But when I was coming, I saw Kekro Koto and some other politicians leaving. So I got scared. I said, I wonder what has happened. Then, Gao Jun said, Mr. Harris said, we beg you. You know, we're all learning. Let's say so. And then the late Sublamo said, I'm sorry, he's dead now. Makuma, you should be careful. I said, oh. Then President Doe said, so Kroma, what do you say as you leave? I said, sir, what I said comes out of the accumulation of my total existence. If it becomes necessary, I will say it again. I will repeat what I said. He said, you are begging for, for, for the mayor, see? Okay, Kroma, you can leave. I said, yes, sir. In exactly two weeks, something happened. 
And I made a same statement. But before I made that statement, hmm, the people have a parable. Bopul Pele, that's what my mother speaks, used to speak. There, some will call you now I'm bong bumu. There, Lord, don't look at Sapia Konuta, and there, Paron Sai Pele, Manama, Nja Koko Manamwe. Nyan, Lord, Va Koko Manamme. Yamo, Noroma, Beka, Doyin Sun, Jeffe Gauma, Boma, Ngo, Atanda ilongi eragon. They say only he who knows, only the hunter who knows the turtle very well and wants to kill it, it will shoot it under the arm. Because you spend the whole day shooting the turtle on the back, you will not catch it. That means you don't know what a total is. You have to do one of the arm. Zamiko nu no am bungumu. So I had to prepare for the second statement. Because the way I left, I was able to get an insurance for seventy five thousand dollars life insurance for my young family. I was able to secure somewhere before two little old taxes and I told my wife I'm going to make a statement everybody's in Bel Air now so I don't know whether they will come out or not but I have to make this statement if anything happens to me this is a premium statement a certificate 75,000 US dollars and a taxi if y'all can take that she said is it worth it I said, yes, it's worth it. Because this is what we stand for. And this is how we have grown up around. We can't have any of this anymore. I wasn't talking to Doe. I was talking to everybody. So I went ahead and told my wife to leave the house and carry the baby somewhere else. Or mother -in -law, my mother-in-law. Leave the house. So I went and made the statement and nothing happened that day. Hmm. The next day, it was the funeral of former Deputy Foreign Minister Robert Okai in Marshall City. So I was just waiting for the order on me. And we went to the funeral, I went late. I went and met President Doe. I already arrived and he was upstairs in some building with all the cabinet ministers. But I didn't see him. He was standing up there, like the balcony there. And that made it very dangerous. Because as soon as I got in the car, all his security people ran to me. Congratulations, Chief. And he was watching from up there. <laughs> so I guess. <laughs> Those security officers probably had to answer. I said, what are you congratulating me for? I said, nothing, I've done nothing. Then somebody said, the president upstairs. So I went upstairs. I am telling you this Liberia. As soon as the minister saw me, my own colleagues, everybody started walking away from me. When I moved near them, they moved away. Carry a bad luck. So I went to President Doe and shook his hand. I said, how are you, sir? He said, I'm fine. I said, oh. So I left the whole group. I came downstairs. Unfortunately for me, when they finally got to the church, I was scared to enter there. I was standing outside near the window. I mean, not too close to the window. Unfortunately for me, it had been rumored that whole week that uh, Jerry Riddle Grimes was one of those people who were thinking about running for the presidency. I didn't know where the old man came from. He came and stood up by me. <laughs> but you 
know he was he was your friend. He was chairman of the board of Letraco, where my brother was working before. So he knew us. He was our father. So every time I move out a little bit, he'll move towards me. And I didn't want to tell him, please move from behind me. <laughs> Unfortunately, I observed the door and I turned around and looked among the cabinet officials and apparently he did not see me. Then he asked somebody on his right hand side and the person pointed his finger out there. And when the door locked, I was standing out there with Jerry Little Grimes. And he said, yeah, they got right against me. few minutes, the funeral didn't end. Go burst out of there. Oh yes, I knew my destiny was just a few seconds away. So I got in the vehicle. You know, I never carry official license plate on my car. Official this, official that. I never left my pro uh, private properties in the office. So I drove straight to the Ministry of Information. So about five, six I met Okiki Davis, who was head of Lena. He said, what happened? You're looking like this. And people talking about the statement that the president said you shouldn't make. The head of state, you shouldn't make it again. I said, you just sit down. In a matter of one hour, I saw a truck loaded with soldiers, SSS people, in the yard of the executive mansion. People jumping all around. I said, okay, can you leave my office? I resigned myself to, to my fate. He said, I can't leave. I will stay right here. And he was one of the most cowardly persons I ever seen in my life. But that day, I don't know where the courage came from. This captain opened the door. He presented me a green letter. There's something very interesting on the call of the letter. And that was the first step. I saw that Mr. Ahaji G. V. Kumar Morel I said, oh, <laughs> what happened to the minister title? <laughs> then I said, okay, can you open the letter? That was the longest letter I ever heard. Every paragraph, I thought the next sentence was going to say, you are therefore hereby placed on arrest or charged with treason or something. So, sentence after sentence, sentence after sentence. Finally, they say, you are therefore dismissed. I said, oh. That all? <laughs> then he said, Minister, therefore I have dismissed you. I said, you better say, thank God. So I asked the officer, I said, is that all? He said, yes, sir. I said, well, you brought this one piece of letter with a whole battalion? He said, that was the order given me. I said, my God. So they left. And the next day, I came to turn over. And I saw one of the deputy ministers there with crocodile tears. He had been, I won't call his name here, please, don't ask me, TRC. He had been going to the mansion, telling Tony, you're sitting out here? You can't look at the, the, uh, the news, what, what's the paper, the Liberian, uh, what's the name of the newspaper that the Ministry of Information are producing? The new Liberia. You don't see the big picture of Emma Sawyer? That Kuma promoting? And the mayor picture so small, Mr. Head of State? Hey, man. They find Head of State in jail, all these people in jail. Then you carry on that kind of propaganda, you wanted me killed. Maybe. Before my dismissal, that incident of uh, jo uh, Johnny McLean, Minister McLean and I, where you talk about, I should wait for my time. I leave that came out. Again, this time, those time. And it was the same day that Polio was arrested. Alexander Thompson, that was the BBC man. He came to me, Mr. Minister, 
So what are you going to do with after the arrest of Podium? I said, what? To myself. I was so embarrassed because I wasn't aware as Minister of Information that the Vice Head of State had been uh, arrested. They were wrestling. I don't know how I walked from that mansion. I mean from the Ministry of Information to the mansion. I went upstairs on the sixth floor and I asked Head of State Doe to speak with him. I remember Dr. Harry Moniba, the then Vice President of the INA, uh, Abraham Colley, Jerry Batu, uh, Jenkins Scott, Sylvester Moses, see what the NSA director. Then I said, Mr. Head of State, I want to talk to you. He said, privately or officially? I said, any way you take it. Then the whole group panicked. Then I remember Abraham calling, said to Do, he said, because Do was furious, he was answering. He said, oh, Do, uh, 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 Chief, excuse me, you know, they bought from Lofa. He got some kind of mental problem every year. Certain time again, come up. So it looks like not catching again. I really wanted to tell you that. So I accepted my craziness. <laughs> then he said, You, Kroma, you call yourself Minister of Information. The people cursing you all over the place with these leaflets. He hasn't said anything. That when I saw that picture and this other thing, all over the place. I said, indeed, my time has come. I said, how many people have read this leaflet? Do you have confidence in me? He said, but I have a problem. I'm beginning to lose confidence in you. Because you don't want to defend me. I said, I'm a professional person. I'm a technocrat. I'm a technocrat. So I will not promote this leaflet here. I don't know how many people haven't read it. And they are the underdog. I said, we're faced with such a situation during the Torah administration. So I will not do it. He said, you see, how do you know? He's supporting Mojang and PVP. I said, oh, where did you get that information? He said, I heard it. I said, oh, I also heard that you put $7 million in the Swiss bank. He said, oh, where you heard it from? I said, the same place you heard the other one from. Then Abraham Cody said, I told you, Chief, the man sick, he's not well. Let me carry him. I didn't hear anything, quite frankly. I was just saying that. Also, before my dismissal, President Doe summoned a cabinet meeting. He said he had gone to shuffling and informed the people in the barracks, his colleagues, that he was standing for the election. Then, he did something that really broke my camel's back. He said in the cabinet meeting, I've already organized the NDPL. I think he said Gray Allison was the acting chairman. Huh? Somebody like that. I said, oh. You've already organized a party? And already having a chairman? He said, yes. And I'm giving you people until the end of the month to resign if you will not be part of my party because I don't want you to disturb my government. For all due respect to the late, because he's no longer living, Minister of Defense Gray Allison said he was the first to speak. He said, Mr. Mr. Harris, I'm behind you 1,000%. So one by one, the members of the cabinet 
I think except one person declared that they were 1,000, some of them 3,000 percent behind the president. So after that, then Gladison said, Excuse me, Mr. Edison. We haven't heard from Minister Kromar. Oh. Then don't look at me. I didn't say anything. He said, Yes, what do you say, Kromar? I said, I have nothing to say. He said, You gotta say something. I said, Will you allow me to illustrate what I want to say? He said, Yes. I said, Please ask Mr. Edison to stand up. Then Doe started smiling. I guess he suspected I was out for some mischief. So Gladys stood up. Then I walked and stood up behind Gladys. I said, Mr. Edison, let us assume you are in Gray Edison's position right now. If somebody were to shoot you, would a bullet touch me from the front? He said, no. I say, I've come to the side. I'm standing on the side of Gray Edison. I say, if somebody were to open an automatic rifle here, what is the possibility that a bullet would touch Gray Edison and me? He said, very high. I say, if I want to be with you, I'll be on your side. I will not be behind you. <laughs> because we have been behind each other in this country for so long in deceit and hypocrisy. All the 2,000 percent people behind you, they were to remain behind you until something pick you up from the front. So those might say, who are behind me? <laughs> <laughs> Not a single of the 1,000 percent people stood up. <laughs> they said, well, I'm a side. Everybody got up. This was the nature of our country. The deceit and hypocrisy is one of the root causes of our problem today. We're so dishonest and hypocritical. Look at Liberia. Every day we pass through a crowd. We can't even see electric wire anywhere, but we see light everywhere. Young country like that. 1958 independence, we got 1847 independence. What made us to be like this? The Matigo Po say, Sema Sani Bali to Sebena. You can't want to run at the same time, splash your foot. You either bear the itch and run, or you stand up and scratch the itch. All of the time, we want to squash the each at the same time run. That's how time we're always falling. So in our second statement, supporting democracy and condemning one party state, I was dismissed. And I went home. I can say I was virtually put on a house arrest because I couldn't come outside. A lady from the Ministry of Defense came and said, they said, I should carry the uniforms. You know, we're all majors. I said, I don't have any uniform for you. I bought my own uniform. So I will donate it to you personally. After two weeks, and mind you, I know and felt that Doe really liked me personally. From the time I used to read that news, I was a star. But I didn't take advantage of that. I felt that he liked me, and by himself he was a good person. Phone call. I was shocked. Midnight, the phone rang. I recognized his voice. But I was young, 31 years old, probably too emotional. He said, and I will never forget this encounter. Kumar, I said, yes, sir. How are you doing? I told him, and I quote myself, verily, Mr. Harris said, man may condemn man, but if God 
does not condemn man, man is not condemned. Man may condemn man. But if God does not condemn man, man is not condemned. He said, what kind of power are you giving me so? And then I put my hand in the telephone wires. And then I cut it off. I didn't want anybody to call me again. When Amos father and the people in jail were released, he sent a message to me that he wanted to see me secretly. So at night he took a taxi and came to me. He went to the back room. He said, Haji, I want to thank you for your efforts at democracy. I was in jail and I heard what you said. I said, thank you, sir, but I didn't do it for you. I did it for all of us. He said, I understand that. I was not in Moja, I was not in PPP. I felt that my consciousness preceded Moja and PPP activities. I knew that. From what I had gone through with my father's experience, I was intense. The consciousness of democracy and equality. I believe Sora was talking about recruitment in the Liberian People's Party. But I had not decided, I had not decided to join any party. I was still contemplating. Then William E. Dennis Jr. came. I said, which party you belong to? The true party? He said, no, we're forming something new. And I want you to be a member. I said, okay, bring a platform. Let me see. Your manifesto. Then one morning, I heard on the radio, I heard Kuwampa saying that they had decided to take the ultimate gamble. And that they are all through the government and that Hell Estate Door was in hiding. Cassette recording, I thought, not at the time. I thought it was a live something. Immediately in the morning, six, seven o'clock, people started running. Some good amount of people were in the vicinity. They came running to my house. Mr. Kumar, your God has seen the man. What did this miss you for? I think Kumar is going to appoint you Minister of Information again. I said, oh God. That was a time that no other word had come on the air only that one cassette expression that door was in hiding. I said, for three, four hours now, door is standing hiding. They see him word for word. I said, no. Something gone wrong somewhere. And that was soon confirmed when Jaja Kamara Masakwe. <laughs> Not Kamara. <laughs> uh, uh. Masakwe, one in the air. He said, we are watching you coming from Shuffling. And we attack you by land, air, or sea. I said, oh. That was the first battalion on the corner. Most of right were coming in favor of Doe. And then I knew right away that there was trouble. In the end, the coup failed. Kuomba was killed. I think we heard a precipitating story from Boema family the other day. Then they started calling names. 
And if I don't need the axe to come to the mansion, I thought my knee would be the next knee. Because I thought somebody may have seen those people dancing in my eyes. I said, Come on, I'm happy too. Why is it naked? Me scared, fighting, was that <laughs> Noah, John Noah, one of the cool leaders. They arrested him just three houses away from my house. I was sleeping. And my young cousin woke up and said, the guy Noah, I said, where? They said, from the house over there. I said, my goodness. But where, where, where deep in Dupo Road? So I said, open the back door. He said, what happened? I said, I have to leave. He said, if they find you running in the place, you see. And that Kuwampa episode became a basis of big division that haunted the Doe administration. I'm turning the pages over because I've already discussed all of that. The NPFL invasion. Commissioner Verde, may I have the privilege of drinking some water? Yes. They already have some water here. Yes, Thank you. I'm going to a serious error. Is that a commissioner of Massa Washington on your left? Yeah. Oh, okay. I haven't seen her for quite a while. announced that the Liberian government had, to, had dismantled an attempt to an attempt by dissident forces to overthrow the government. He said the insurgents had entered the Liberian town of Butuo on December the 24th from the Ivory Coast and attacked the customs and immigration checkpoints killing a Liberian army sergeant called Godfrey McCarthy, and injuring another surgeon, Thomas Cocker. He said the rebels burned down several parts of Butuo, including the customs office. He said they took the Liberian flag and hoisted something else, which we came later to know was the NPFL flag, with an image of a sprawling black scorpion engraved on a red background. President Doe said the dissidents dispatched another group to Monrovia to destabilize the government. He claimed that the dissidents were so impressed with the street lights and the generally brisk outlook of the capital Monrovia until they decided to join the citizens to have a good time for the season. Doe was visibly angry, pointing fingers to the government of the Ivory Coast, which he said helped 
the dissidents launch their operation. He was therefore recalling from the Ivory Coast Ambassador Harold Ta, a crown and a relative of the First Lady, Nancy Do. The United Nations, the Organization of African Unity and the Economic Community of West African States will be immediately notified, do declared. It was then that I realized that there was war on him. I have been reappointed after several years into the government. I just heard my name on the radio that I have been reappointed Director General of the LBS after having served as Minister of Information and earlier in the same position. I didn't go to the office. I think at the time, Buya was Minister of Information. Buya had worked with me through that traumatic period when I was Minister. He was appointed Assistant Minister of Information. So, somebody came and said, do you embarrass the president? Go and pick up your job, your position. I had been dismissed. I didn't want any more trouble. After my dismissal, I ran as president of the Barrow School Association. It became a big political issue. Because someone told President Doe, who was a Barrow man, that Kroma wants to revenge through sports. He wants to embarrass you. That's why he's taking over your team. But then, how he was flogging Barrow on a daily basis. Nine times in a row. So Paul Mulba, that's why your mentor and all these people came. In short, I became president of Barrow Sports Association. In two years, we defeated IE 13 times and became triple champions, both soccer and basketball. John Bear, who was very close to the president, and he was also president, he said, you see, I told you about Kromat. Because he said that we were organizing borough branches in various communities in Morovia. What kind of football business is Borough branch in Oro, Borough branch Yama, Borough branch Yukuta. Enough or nothing. But we gave the results, and Doe had mixed feelings. He was sitting one day in uh, here in Duba. I don't know whether you're around here. Hey, Duba, what team are you in? He said, oh, chief, a barrel mail. Serious high email. <laughs> you know what happened on the football field one day? We all were there, barrel and I were playing. And Opon took the shot for I. There was nobody on that field, including the referee, who didn't see that that ball was going into Barrow goal, Barrow net. One jump that Heron Duba jumped in that place. Go! And Duba turn around and look at him. <laughs> but the ball didn't go in. So he didn't see how still on the earth with a goal bend and Duba looking at him. He said, it can't be goal. <laughs> don't say you don't say you too bad you better sit down with your DC <laughs> so that's how do side of you again better so I was now director general Liberia Institute for strategic studies where we combined economics, communication, and law. It's part of our professional background. We had some consultants. I was already teaching at the University of Liberia since 1984. And we had our colleagues. So we made some money there as consultants, doing projects, 
I was appointed as a representative of, of the Center for the Development of Industry of the European Union. We got contracts from the Central Bank. And we made some money, some serious money. Then I built a couple of houses. <laughs> some of them are still incomplete. In my entire life, I have never been accused of corruption. And up to today, if anybody has any information or any corrupt activity, I want you to come forward. So when I graduated from the Lewis Autogram School of Law Honors, right here, where they were giving our certificates, you could tell whether somebody was popular or not. Each person they call, you hear the clapping. Well, I cannot describe that. It would sound very boastful. But apparently it impacted though. The next day, when he was on the air again at the LBS, he said, I didn't take him pay for six months. I didn't go there. Eventually, I got there. I'll try to get a contract this time from Doe. Because every time Charles Badger and all these announcers they said something that was not fair about, you will see the SSS car will come for them. So we'll carry you. I said, nobody is leaving this place here. That's my announcer. If you want to carry, you got to carry me first. So I told Doe, I said, I'm not going by the ABC unless we agree on a number of things. No SSS car, give me a free hand, and a number of other things. He said, in fact, you are hereby elevated to a cabinet minister position. That's how come today the director general of LBS attends cabinet meeting. Because you are minister of information. So you are equal to your cabinet. So I became member of the cabinet again. And so those things for us, y'all bring your recorders. Some confessions taking place. Confessions in the mayor Charles Taylor. In this interview, Charles Taylor said his forces were in control of Butuo and several adjacent villages and that he had ordered the operation as leader of the National Patriotic Front of Liberia. He said the Patriotic Front was originally organized by the late Brigadier Thomas Kuwengpa, quote, of which this is a continuation of the 1985 situation, quote unquote, referring to the abortive coup plan, coup plan led by General Kuwengpa. Taylor quickly released some statistics professing that uh, they entered with 105 men on December the 25th and has since expanded the number to 600. He claimed that his forces had killed about 250 AFL soldiers with NPFL losses he could not specify. Taylor said fierce fighting was going on, refuting those President Doe's assertion that everything was under control. And then came the statement that was soon to be exposed as not true. The rebel leader said he was not personally interested in becoming president of Liberia and only interested in removing Doe. He said with the departure of Doe, democratic elections will be held after 90 days. When a BBC interviewer suggested that Mr. Taylor was a discredited person who had stolen government money and fled, Taylor opted to tie himself with the United States and say he was a capitalist economist. The Focus on Africa interview on New Year's Day was the beginning of a series that converted the Focus on Africa program into a multiple instrument of propaganda in the Liberian war. And Taylor used it effectively. He used it as his war propaganda machine until Liberians accused the BBC of fighting about 40% of Taylor's war. Second, Liberians dispersed as refugees all over the sub-region and the program use the program to keep in touch with the fluctuating events in their country. The international community monitored 
the Liberian situation mostly through focus. With that interview, everything was now in the open. People were now concerned, but not panicky. President Dole decided to emphasize the Ivorian and other external connections with what effectively became known as the invasion. The NPFL men captured in Monrovia had confessed about their recruitment in the Ivory Coast and their travel to Burkina Faso on to Libya for military training. Doe was determined to rally public and international support by convincing everyone that Taylor was just a tool in a wider scheme to dethrone the government and subjugate Liberia. Doe was contemplating on invoking the mutual defense pact with Guinea if it became necessary using the invasion by foreign forces as a basis. Several days later, Justice Minister Jenkins Scott sent videotape of three cap captives that Doe had mentioned in his speech. A joint security team interrogated the men. In the tapes, which were transmitted on national television, the three men identified themselves as Samuel Dunn, Augustine Gonkanu, and George Nguyen, distinctively Gyo and Mana names of Nima County. They alluded to a massive insurgency plan to top of the Doe government and indicated that Charles Taylor, the former controversial director general of the General Services Agency and confidant of Doe, led their country. The linkage of Taylor was surprising to Monrovia residents who remembered Taylor being locked up in a United States prison since 1985. He was in prison at the Plymouth House of Correction in Boston, Massachusetts in connection with the extradition suit filed by the Liberian government. Taylor was being sought to account for nearly one million dollars he allegedly stole in some arrangement with a foreign company. The televised confession by Nguyen Dan and Konkanu dwelled understandably only on the exploits of Taylor starting with his presence in Burkina Faso and how the plans had quietly prioritized Manos and Gyo's recruitment and mobilization. The men individually repeated how they and others were lured by special emissaries and Taylor himself by making repeated references to how the Gyo's and Manos were disenfranchised by the Doe government and the only way to return and live freely in Liberia was to get rid of Do. The captives revealed or alleged that simultaneous attacks were planned for Monrovia and Nima County and they were part of the group that traveled to Monrovia. Their contacts in the AFL were to provide the necessary arms and ammunition and join them for final action. Officers from the 1st Infantry Battalion in Shuffling, 33 miles south of Monrovia, were said to have been contacted, along with some from the 6th Battalion in Tottenburg, Bomi County, some 43 miles west of Monrovia. This confusion and the delay in the arrivals of the Monrovia contacts at designated points undermined the execution of the mission. The confessors wondered about suspiciously, suspiciously until government agents picked them up at various points in the city. The three men never gave an account of what happened to the rest of their colleagues who came to Monrovia from the Ivory Coast. The gesture ministry said they escaped. The nation's concentrated population in Monrovia had mixed reactions to the government pronouncements about the coup attempt. Some felt 
that the three men were coerced and coached into narrating the story about Libya and Burkina Faso. Others believed the, conf the confessions were genuine and sagged that a potentially devastating war had been averted. Yet, others actually wished that to go. The Gil Manor attraction. Associating his war endeavor with Kuangba and the NPFL was a continuation of the strategy Taylor deployed in mobilizing many members of the Gil and Manor ethnic groups of Nima County. The scheme attracted Kuangba's military companions such as Cooper Miller, the designated Taylor vice president, and Prince Wyatt Johnson, who later broke away and organized the Independent National Patriotic Front. Others were Isaac Musa, Isaac Menza, who was called Musa, who later became Taylor's military chief. The Taylor civilian team, which involved former Labor Minister Moses Duopo, another Gil named Secretary, another Gil, was named Secretary General of the NPFL. He seemed to have convinced the two Nimba tribes that, uh, that uh, this was an opportunity to revenge against Doe. Taylor is said to have promised lucrative government jobs and that upon entering Morovia and on seating the government, they could take over any private residence of their choice. The Doe Kuangpa animosity was the most important but not the only compartment of Taylor's grand design and his supporters in America and the Ivory Coast to exploit those internal and external antagonists. Hofa Boini, President Hofa Boini and the Ivory Coast had problems with Doe over the death of their son-in-law, A.B. Talbot. Boini had extended his influence over the Burkina Faso leadership, which had developed its own steep ties with Gaddafi, the sworn enemy of Doe. The United States had become wary of Doe, a mood indeed, among other factors, by anti liberians in the United States. From all of this, Taylor became the point man. Taylor concretized his West African and Libyan connections only after his escape from the Boston prison. All the U.S. government could say about the jailbreak was that Taylor, Taylor was wanted in connection with the Felonious Act and he was being held in extradition proceedings for corrupt charges in Liberia. He had miraculously gotten out with two other inmates said to have found his way to Mexico and then out to an unspecified European country. He was again jailed along his African sojourn in Sierra Leone and Guinea and Ghana, sorry, on suspicion of subversive activities. His lady friend is said to have played a crucial role in his release from the Accra prison and handed to the Burkina government. She is said to have been shuttling between Abidjan and Ouagadougou won the admiration of key people in the Burkina political hierarchy. In Ouagadougou, Taylor is said to have quickly enrenched, entrenched himself and secured a soul made in Blaise Campari, deputy to President Thomas Sankara. Many have described the ties with Campari as the most fundamental in sustaining Taylor's quest for the executive mansion. Some sources say Taylor and his men have Kampaori in taking power, during which President Sankara was assassinated. Sankara was himself a protege of Ufue Boine, but grew too radical, quote unquote, and was dumped by the old man. Doe was clearly the next to go at all costs, even if, if it meant destructively putting tribes and states at odds in the sub region one French-speaking diplomat to Gyo and Mano officials had genuine concerns. Besides the intense aura of suspicion in Monrovia about their loyalty to the government, they could not be seen and they could not be sure about an invasion that was led presumably 
by a reckless child stealer from an American Liberian settlement near Monrovia. The only girl name of consequence disclosed as a part of the leadership of the LPFL at the time was Moses Dupo, former labor minister in the early days of the Doe government. He had fled Liberia and together with Kuomba founded the NPFL. Dupo spoke from Lagos, Nigeria on the radio indicating he was Secretary General of the NPFL and insisted that Doe must go. The former labor minister was to meet his death when he went to Lima County to join Taylor, according to accounts. President Doe knew that a rift which led to the death of Kuwampa haunted him, and without genuine reconciliation, Nima would remain his nemesis as long as he was president. Doe arranged a solidarity meeting in November 1987 with the largely Guan Manor people of Nima in their provincial capital of San Iquili, a historic city which hosted President Tutman, President Secretary of Guinea, and President Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana. The gathering attempted to sort differences among the parties, which were essentially named as crowns and kills and manners. The ethnic groups concluded a peace agreement and returned to Monrovia in high spirit. With celebrations that were supposed to mark a new beginning, even when former Vice Head of State Nicholas Podia entered from the Ivory Coast allegedly on his way to overthrow the government in Monrovia, Nima was not blamed. The aftermath of the peace agreement helped in some ways to secure a check and balance in ethnic power politics that was devastating the crowns and their Lima cousins. When news of a plot emerged sometime after the San Nicola meeting, some local chiefs felt it was unfair to carry on that scheme against Doe. Client Chief Gerald Goyon alerted authorities in Monrovia about the plan, which was apparently the recruitment phase of the Taylor invasion. Doe instructed the Minister of Internal Affairs, Edward Komosako, to investigate the complaint immediately. Saka, in turn, ordered the superintendent of the county, Stephen Daniels, to do the investigation. Near the end of this exercise, Minister Saka himself traveled to Lima. This minister wielded a lot of support in the county. His father was a prominent Matingo chief, widely respected in the area. Superintendent Daniels and Saka concluded in their report that Clan Chief Goyon had lied in alleging dissident activities in the county, in the county, and that his aim was to besmear the image of the girls and manners again. I could understand the rationale in the Saka ruling. He did not want to be seen as the Matingo man with Gio connections who again invited the wrath of the Doe regime following a long struggle to bring peace. He may have sincerely believed that it was nothing but local wrangling for power and importance. Saka chose to placate his people and let the president know that the allegations were coming from a miscreant bent on making trouble for the people. The clan chief Goyon was jailed. It however came to pass that the words of the clan chief were proven with the insurrection of the MPFL. Doe promptly dismissed Mr. Saka after the new year was stopped short of arresting him. Saka had been otherwise faithful and loyal activists for Doe in mobilizing people throughout the country during the 1985 elections. Sika, Saka himself was selected as a senator for NIMBA on the president's National Democratic Party ticket. Besides, Saka's connection with two crucial tribes in the conflict could not be ignored, nor could Doe forget 
that his minister was once a very senior officer when he served as Lieutenant Colonel, a commander of the Presidential Honors Guard in the administration of the late President William Talbot. The Majingo Factor. Get some water. The Madingo factor. The involvement of Madingos as victims of the Taylor onslaught was a source of bewilderment for me personally. I had heard some past accounts of conflicts among the tribes in Nimba, but that was neither peculiar to that county of the tribes throughout Liberia, Africa and outside the continent neighboring ethnic groups wage wars against each other reference to this type of history could not justify brutal killing of the Madingos in Lima however where a mutual peace treaty and oath has guided interactions for several generations between the Madingos on the one hand and the Gyo and Mano on the other. Original indigenous configuration of Nimba consists of these three tribes Matingo, Mano, Gyo, along with the Bees, the Basso subgroup, and the Crowns of Belawale. These are the five tribes of Nimba County. Since their kingdoms collapsed in northwestern Liberia in the mid 19th century, Matingos have become apolitical and concentrated only on commerce. Most non-Liberian reference books configured the country's population as 10 to 15 percent Christian at the time, 15 to 20 percent Muslim, and the rest as African enemies, quote unquote. But historically, Matingo Muslims were isolated by the predominantly Christian American Liberian settlers despite the decisive role of King Sao Boso in, in helping to resolve the conflict between the settlers and the indigenous in the Monrovia area. The newcomers to the continent feared that the Madingo king would ultimately extend his control over the disputed area and declare himself absolute ruler for all. The settlers soon began maneuvering to strengthen the nearby Kongba Gola king called Zoga, a rival of King Salpus. The Golas were told that the Matingos had to be aliens, otherwise, why would they persistently refuse to join the poorer society of the Golas? Though Salpuso was never defeated until his death, the various warring factions were incited against him by Monrovia. Madingos for a long time refrained from national politics. They sent few of their children to formal Liberian English schools. The heavy presence of Madingos in Nima and Bon counties as part of the permanent tribes of those counties hardly changed the perception. Despite their confirmed genealogical roots in the original ethnology of these areas, Nima was generally seen as the home of only Q and Mana people, ignoring the Matingos, bees, and clowns. Similarly, Lofa County was seen by Muslim and Roving urbanites as land of the Loma tribe, even though the county has eight at the time of Liberia's 16 officially listed ethnic groups. Some Liberians are usually surprised to know there is an exclusively Matingo chiefdom in Lofa now a district where the Madingos and their Loma and Bandi cousins have cohabited for several hundred years. In their war and peace, they intermarried and interacted with their ancestors from the great Mali and Songhe empires. My mother comes from the Madingo Mecca chiefdom in Bomi County, where most of the direct descendants of King Saoboso live. The late husband of President Ellen Johnson Salif, 
Doc Salif is one of the descendants of the Sao Bolso cluster of Matingo families that came from Lufa to fill the Bopolu bombing in Cape Mount corridors. In River Sets, in Nima County itself, Matingo served as Parma chiefs, the most important and powerful authority in the hierarchy of officially recognized indigenous leadership. Another contributor to the suspecting Matingo citizenship in Liberia is that the country has a relatively small percentage of the overall Matingo population of nearly 10 million in 11 of the 16 West African countries. Neighboring Guinea has the largest share of about 2.6 million. Nevertheless, the flow of French-speaking Matingos into Liberia from the Francophone countries like Guinea and Ivory Coast was being overplayed more than the new and frequent arrivals into Liberia of Guinean Lomans and Kisis, Mano, Gyo, Kran and Grevos from the Ivory Coast and the Mande, Kisi and Vai from Sierra Leone. These are hardly referred to as foreigners. It was during the 1985 multi-party era that Mandingos again began actively developing interests in politics. A number of them joined President Doe's NDPL party, while the vast majority of them enlisted with the unity party of Dr. Edward Bian Kessely, a Christian Matingo. Kessely, a British American and Swiss educator international relations expert, served in several ministerial positions under President William Talbot as an indigenous and son of the commanding general of the armed forces of Liberia at the time, Kessel stirred up emotions among the ruling class when he suggested the changing of Liberia's national motto, the love of liberty brought us here. Kessel said the motto as coined by the American Liberians in 1847 did not refer to the majority indigenous population. Mm -hmm. Brigadier General Brian Kessely, his father, immediately after the speech, was retired from the AFL and Edward Kessely was made Minister of Information. The American Liberian elite was fearful of the implication of a well-educated radical indigenous whose father happened to have control fighting forces of the army. When Taylor rebels arrived, the Matingos had no compelling reason to take up arms massively against the Doe regime. Yes, Doe had jailed Kessely along with other politicians before the elections. Matingos in the, in the NDPL were angry, but not enough to join a rebel war started by Charles Taylor. Individuals who wanted particularly to target Madingos using the justification that the Madingos were exposing the girls to the AFL soldiers got reactions. The Madingos said they did not have weapons to protect themselves against the rebels who targeted, who targeted some of them in the first place for reasons ranging from party affiliation to betraying fellow Nimbians. Where they suspected rebels planning to attack them, the Matingos had no alternative but to alert the AFL soldiers. In less than two months of the MPFL invasion, hundreds of Matingos had been slaughtered in Nima County. In the towns of Tiaple and Ban, the situation was particularly woeful. As the war continued, Matingos or anyone wearing a gown was presumed to be a Matingo and could not survive the NPFL targeting. The story was the same everywhere in Liberia. When a Western reporter asked an NPFL commander in Kakata as to what happened to the Madingos there, the reply was, those Madingos that could not run away 
will kill them like chicken. When the NPFL arrived, When the NPFL arrived, the son of a prominent Muslim offered his life in exchange for the sparing of his father, the son was killed along with his father. So was the story in Bakadu and other places where scores of Majimos were killed. Even on the Sun Maka Highway in Bombay, the home of my mother, towns were burned, people killed simply because they were Muslims and therefore had to be considered as Madinos. Sorry. In the days following President Doe's making statement on the insurgency, here the Chief of Staff, Henry Duba, and Justice Minister Scott continue to echo the Commander-in-Chief's claims that the rebels had been thwarted and the Army was now carrying on mopping exercises. Jenkins Scott spent nearly a decade in the United States 
before returning to Monrovia with a law degree in 1981. It was a bastion of American style characterization that graphically illustrated Jenkins Scott <coughs> graphically illustrated the intensity of the speaker's opinion about his enemy. Scott described Taylor and his group, quote, as two, two best friendless and yellow belly people who are taken to terrorist tactics. The word mopping was above all the magic wand that was supposed to allay public fears. But it ended up having the exact opposite effect. The public rapidly perceived the government insurance with jaundiced eyes. The security authorities used mopping until they simply became ridiculous to mention it even to the Shushan boys in downtown Monrovia. The elusive movements of the dissident fighters were a source of frustration for the government troops who were practically un unfamiliar with guerrilla warfare. The mopping up exercise evidently became meaningless and news began to filter in Monrovia about AFL conduct in Nimba. <clears throat> Most who fled towards Monrovia feared being rebel targets, while those fearful of the government troops fled mainly into the Ivory Coast. <clears throat> Having survived rebel cruelty, many of the displaced people coming to Monrovia were naturally unenthusiastic relaying AFL wrongdoing. The ship of Monrovia. Nimba certainly did not have the monopoly on fear. Unfolding events in Monrovia show that Liberia was plunged into a nightmare on the heads of the government's revelation of the border incident. Monrovia woke up to the knee-shaking news about the killing of a prominent businessman and button politician Robert Phillips. His body was found at his Monrovia sinkhole residence. Rumors quickly circulated that it was the handiwork of government agents. The government vehemently denied this. Some argue that many American Liberians at the funeral were concerned only because the American Liberian had been killed and that the death that was being inflicted by Taylor, another American Liberian, meant nothing to them. Others responded that it was alarming for such a killing to be taking place at the seat of government, which was condemning the invasion and the destruction of innocent lives. Two other alleged mysterious killings occurred in the suburbs of Monrovia. The Justice Ministry announced the alleged murder of a Togolese national identified as David Opati and a sergeant of the Executive Guard Battalion, Peter Collet, who was killed on the Saturday night President Doe revealed the coup on television. The external calisthenics. President Doe thinly viewed his threat to push the war across the border in the Ivory Coast where the NPFL had come from. He wanted and warned the Liberia could exercise the right of hot pursuit under international law. Quote, Liberia is prepared to protect its borders and this country will not be used as a battleground, he added in contrast to the battle that was already spreading. Then the protest note went on to the Ivorian without any immediate reply. The Liberian government sent messages to the Libyan and Burkina Faso governments asking whether they knew about the NPFL. The government certainly did not expect an answer from Gaddafi and Kambaori incriminating themselves. Though insisted 
that the two countries had to respond since they have been categorically mentioned as the recruitment and training centers for the rebels. Dorsey, Libya was answers to endanger American interest and lives in Liberia, and that Taylor was prepared to kill any American on the orders of Gaddafi. How these statements were to shape international policies towards the Doha administration and the war we have been seen later. The names of Ivory Coast, Burkina Faso, and Libya from there on were the strategy, though adopted in attracting international sympathy for the government and outrage against the NPFL. The United States, Nigeria, and Guinea were the key targets for the Doe outreach. Relations with the United States were not at their best when the rebels arrived, but Doe was confident the danger of a Gaddafi-backed takeover was sufficient to attract Washington. But analysts could not help but wonder how Taylor had broken jail in the United States in the first place. U.S. complicity was suspected and with the tough stance of Ambassador James Bishop in his demand for proper government accountability in Monrovia, it was speculated in Monrovia that Americans were behind the invasion. <laughs> President Ibrahim Babangida, on the other hand, was a personal friend whom Doe felt he could rely on. They were regularly on the phone calling each other SK and IB. Though Nigeria was to play the most crucial role, stopping the war in Liberia to pave the way for the elections of 1997, Babangida was having his share of leadership strife in Nigeria. He had just carried out a major reshuffle in his military leadership that was threatening some dire security and political consequences. The number three man in his government, Lieutenant General Dramkai Bali, was unceremoniously dropped from his portfolio of defense minister, chief of defense staff, and given the Minister of Internal Affairs assignment. I B B himself took over the defense ministry in addition to his presidency. President Conte of Guinea and Joseph Momo of Sierra Leone showed immediate concern for good reasons. Besides their membership in the Mano River Union, grouping the three countries under customs arrangements, Refugees have started flowing into Guinea and Sierra Leone. The two countries had much closer ethnic, commercial, and political links with Liberia than the Ivory Coast. Relations between Monrovia and Freetown were at best lukewarm from the onset of the Doha administration, worsening with the coup by invasion from Sierra Leone. With the latest problem, Mama. Dispatch an envoy with a special message to Doe, while Conte caution all dissidents in Guinea that may have been residing all over the place to leave his country. In all of this, Doe remained evidently confident that the NPFL Bush war was not really a serious threat. Thus, the commander in chief himself decided it was time to visit the battlefront. House of Representatives member Mohamed Kroma from Nima County, commonly known as Chicken Soup by his colleagues for his amiable personality, left the crowd laughing in Ganta, Nima, when he innocently likened the Charles Taylor rebel movement to that of a, a goat. And I quote, you want to be like Bella Goat? When Bella go one woman, you see, the woman got 
does not have underclothes. And the male is equally naked. But the whole day, the male goes and running behind a woman. Do you want woman or running around? Joe is in Morovia and not in Nimba. If Taylor wants a government, let him go to Morovia and start running around in Nimba and destroying our people. Unquote. Then the legislator turned to Joe and said, quote, No one will remove you unless the God that put you there. Indeed, God must have allowed Doe several months later to voluntarily go to his death at the port of Monrovia where his enemies have failed to capture the mansion where he was holed in for nine months. Veteran politician Gabriel Barkers Matthews was quick to declare that his United People's Party was against any effort to destabilize the country and undermine the constitution of Liberia. Barkers always prided himself with being a grassroots politician who remained on the ground at the time to tackle problems and despise rivals like Tobana Chipote and Amos Sawyer who he said should not stay abroad and fight at the time. He did not spare the opportunity to once again caution those in exile against quote lawless ways to solve problems and wait for the 1991 general elections. He also called on the government to respect the rights of those captured. Though it did not take too long to adopt Bacchus and his UPP group as the opposition that was to be tolerated in the upcoming 1991 elections. Both Doe and Bacchus Matthews appeared to have wanted the political space limited to a ruling NDPL in an opposition UPP. The constitutional clause of disqualifying presidential aspirants who did not live in Liberia for 10 consecutive years stood as a waiting tool for the exiles. Gabriel Polet's Liberia Unification Party and Edward Kesselly's Unity Party were part of the local recipe, recipe Doe decided to integrate in his NDPL menu. That plan eventually failed. Polet was out there languishing in jail on the usual treason sedition charges. Liberian governments have unsparingly used to decimate political opponents. Soon, a wary player will be released and a generous offer of cooperation will be made. With Kesselly heavily depending on the Madingo and Muslim constituencies, 20% of the Liberian population, according to the CIA fact book then, though calculated that my involvement, Haji Kumar's involvement with the NDPL will undercut the UP. The only risk in this calculation was that I did not have an NDPL membership party card, even though I was a member of the cabinet. I had not finished my consultations as to whether I should become a member of NDPL or any other political party. As the war progressed, I left Buchanan after a visit there, I wanted to know how far the NPF, the NPF rebels had reached. I left Buchanan later that afternoon with little assurances that the AFL was going to succeed. Inter interestingly, when I got out of Grand Bassa along the route to Monrovia, I ran into a small convoy of AFL officers and soldiers led by Brigadier General Edward Smith who had led the first government counterattacks in Nimba and General Smith asked me where I was coming from and I told him Buchanan. I remember he was accompanied by the U.S. military attaché in Monrovia. The attaché specifically asked me whether the rebels had not reached Buchanan. And the look on his face did not seem like somebody who was afraid of rebels entering the city. 
He was more of a curiosity. And General Smith's men were heavily armed as if though they had already gotten information that the rebels were in Bikini. So they were relieved when they saw me, a civilian coming out of there, making no alarm. That was an interesting situation that left me wondering what was going on. The seas of Ulimo. I had returned to Monrovia from the United States by way of Dakar, Senegal. I was out there investigating whether we could find a mobile radio transmitter that will have the power of covering the entire nation and be imported to Liberia. On the flight home, back home, I met with the former powerful director of police, Edwin Smythe, commonly known in Monrovia as Bob. He was a well-lubricated skion of the Tatman elite era, but was strangely in good books with the ghetto communities in Monrovia. He seemed, <laughs> he seemed to have combined a symbolism of a tough police chief with a character that virtually made him a friend to small-time offenders and hustlers of the Monrovia back streets. On the flight, Bob looked visibly shaken, sitting to, next to me, and was naturally curious to know what he was returning to in Monrovia. He inquired from me about the latest development back home. But I could not assure him of safety based on information I had. For sure, however, I told him I was definitively returning home. From there, I lost sight of Bob during our overnight transit in Dakar, Senegal. I learned Bob continued the journey home, but shortly after I went back to the United States before Monrovia erupted into battle flames. Thank you. He died of natural causes a couple of years later. When I met President Doe to report the outcome of the trip, the broadcast plan was no longer a priority. Perhaps the heat of the battle of country ironically undermined the President's sensitivity to the need to launch a counter-offensive media campaign against the advancing rebels. I was told to wait with all of that, I was not actually convinced that the rebels would have succeeded, or at least that was naturally my wish for the desire. I knew that the most critical moment was still ahead in the war. The rebels seemed determined to capture Monrovia, and the government was poised to resist the collapse of the government at all costs. I returned to Monrovia from the United States and later went to Conakry, Guinea to sympathize with friends who had gone there following the death of an important dear one. <clears throat> I asked President Doe's permission to attend the ceremonies and that became the beginning of the external elements that ultimately led to the formation of Ulimu. In Guinea, I was shocked <clears throat> And, and sad to see the thousands of Liberians poured into the Guinean capital. The majority of them were Liberian Madingos and their families from various other ethnic groups. Nevertheless, the non madingo configuration of the escapees was dramatically changing. At the Liberian embassy ground, which became an instant shelter I saw hundreds of crowns in other tribes that were continuously pouring in from Monrovia. The Guinean countryside known as the forest here near the Liberian border was already inundated with several hundred thousands of Liberians. 
it had a severe impact on me for the first time I saw the effect of the war outside of the country the traditionally proud Liberians had instantly become homeless and beggars washing people's clothes in another country a country that they had rarely visited the experience in Conakry narrowed and sharpened my vision of the options available in rescuing our country from total rebel takeover and the attendant establishment of a draconian bloody rule I was curious about whether the Guinean government was preparing to intervene and stop the rebels. This help was implied several weeks earlier by Guinean President Lansana Conte's visit to Monrovia along with his Sierra Leone counterpart Joseph Momo. My presence in Conakry was private and it was therefore difficult to access officials who could reliably indicate the precise government military disposition on the situation in Liberia. I visited Liberian Ambassador Marcus Kofa many times to inquire but he could not ascertain any specific decision from the Guinean authorities for me to visit them. The dilemma for me at that point was to rejoin the government in Monrovia demonstrating that I did not abandon the government and at the same time indicate to my refugee family in Conakry that I was not abandoning them deliberately, voluntarily exposing myself to death. When I returned to Monrovia the aura spelled doom. There was talk about the rebels had taken over the important port city of Buchanan, the local capital of Grand Bassa County. And they had also virtually taken over the central Bone County. The fall of these strategic counties not far from Monrovia will mean the virtual collapse of the government. Without immediate foreign military intervention, the government will have had to come up with a miraculous plan to reverse the Western military question. When I returned to work the next day, I was told that one of my two deputies could not be on the job because he was ill. The employees told me further that the deputy actually was staying away because he was in the midst of the rumor mill that I was not coming back home. I felt that this and the nature of the reception the airport adequately prepared at the airport adequately prepared me to meet with President Doe that afternoon. But it was one of the better days of the war for the President. The Liberian ambassador to Sierra Leone, retired Major General Abel Kape was waiting to see the president. As usual, top officials waiting to see the president sat in the office of the Minister of State for Presidential Affairs next door to the president. Kape and I were the only two scheduled to see the president at that moment. Kape was considered one of the country's highly trained army officers. Before being appointed as Minister of Defense in 1982, Kape had undergone advanced training abroad, including one that qualified him as a military ranger in the United States. Kape had an uneasy relationship with Doe. During his tenure as Minister of Defense, Kape's brother was executed for alleged involvement in a coup plan against President Doe. In fact, it was widely believed that Doe appointed Kape as ambassador to keep him away from the army and whom. As in every Liberian setting at the time, 
the topic of our discussion was of course the war when I met do when I met Kape. And Kape was not happy with the tactics the armed forces of Liberia was deploying in the war. He felt the guerrilla combat methods of the insurgents had to be dealt with in a superior tactical approach and not through the conventional war approach the AFL was carrying on. From our talk, I was left with the impression that Kape was willing to assume the command of the war and what if Adoro gave him that opportunity. I personally did not feel that it would have been a bad idea. Kape was ushered in to the president's office and spent less than 30 minutes. I did not have the chance for debriefing. I was immediately asked to meet with the president. The next time I saw Kape was in November when he came to visit me in Conakry from Sierra Leone. The meeting with Doe was short. He seemed relieved to have seen me as if my presence was somehow a renewed hope that the government would not fall. Otherwise, why would I come back to Monrovia knowing all the things I know outside of the country? Our conversation concentrated on the need for possible external intervention to help the government. While in Conakry, I had managed to see President Conte just before I left. The Guinean leader told me that the Liberian government had not made any official request and that President Doe indicated that he could not handle the situation. When I relayed this to Doe, he was visibly upset. What did he want me to say? I beg you, come help us. It is clear that this is an invasion which calls for intervention from Guinea under the military agreement between our two countries, Doe exclaimed. I then suggested that an official request be made to the Guinean government outlining what was unfolding. He told me to draft a special message to President Conte. Two hours later, the special message was completed with the help of the mansion staff. Doe had left office and gone upstairs to his living quarters. I was instructed to meet him there. Upon arrival, hmm, I saw Doe keenly attentive listening to the BBC focus program again with Taylor swearing that he would never allow him to remain as president. Quote, I will hold that boy's feet to the fire until he can get out of that mansion. This is not one of those disorganized coup operations. Do is used to. We are coming. Taylor went on. Do, President Do and I exchanged looks. And it was indeed embarrassing to be seated with a president that was being insulted on international media by a former crony and was left helpless to do anything about it. Interesting. I felt sorry for all of us and wondered what will happen to us, to Liberia, especially people like me who qualified in three ways as the target of death. <laughs> I was a government official. I was a Madimo. And then I was a Muslim. How many times will you kill me? I asked President Doe whether the AFL could actually stop the rebels. He frankly told me that he was worried that the government soldiers were not accustomed to guerrilla warfare and had not been involved in actual war. His only hope was to wait for the rebels to come to Monrovia, where he thought he would have the upper hand with a high concentration of men 
and military lajes. Hmm. I then say, oh, President Do, that meant we the civilians targeted had no hope. Apparently, he was looking at the strategies used with the Kuwampa situation and what resulted. Kuwampa came to Monrovia, there was no fighting anywhere, they just came straight to attack the mansion. They had captured nowhere, they had based nowhere, and here was a situation, a situation where the NPFL and by then the INPFL on another front were capturing areas, recruiting people, and organizing their bases, coming step by step. Wherever they pass, they had already solidified their position. So waiting for them in Monrovia was no strategy to have guaranteed military success. The following day, when I came to bid the president farewell, on my way to deliver the special message to Conte, I could not meet him. The executive mansion was gripped with an ominous sense of grief and despair. The commander of the government contingent in Barca, Conor Appleton, had been brutally killed by the rebels. And it was now confirmed that the rebels had taken over the whole of Grand Barca County. They were now on their way to Monrovia, just 75 miles away. I met Joe Tay, a cousin and confidant of the president, commissioner of immigration, downstairs. And even he was told to go home as the president did not want to see anyone. That was not the only problem for the president that day. Various civic groups had organized massive demonstrations in the streets of Monrovia with placards calling for dialogue and peace. The parade quickly turned into a clearly anti door campaign when a number of other groups joined and began shouting, Monkey come down, monkey come down, a call for Do to resign. I left for Guinea by way of road through, through Cape Mount County and Sierra Leone. Air Guinea had just taken off in its last flight from Monrovia in fear that the rebels would hit Monrovia any time. My journey through the government roadblocks exposed the extent of the distrust, mistrust, and anger the soldiers and security personnel had developed against government officials. I had to literally display <laughs> the special message I was carrying in order to be allowed through the checkpoints. I had a copy of the message which I had to read in some instances at some of the checkpoints. I told them that I was going to Guinea for possible help which could include air support throughout the trip on those seriously impaired roads in the Sierra Leone forest, I could not just understand that in just a few months, Liberia had become international headlines for not only a war effort to unseat a, to unseat a government, but for inhumane and brutal acts against civilians. When will it stop? What were the responsibilities of individuals who had one time or the other been activists? Where were they? The advocates of human rights. I recalled my student days. I scanned the rest of my life. Everything appeared meaningless, at least temporarily. It was difficult to deliver the special message to President Conte when I arrived. The Liberian ambassador in Conakry was told to wait as the president was on a brief rest vacation in Dubrika, his hometown some 20 miles from Conakry. A follow-up delegation from Monrovia, headed by Defense Minister Buema Barkley, he was 
uh, how do you call it, commanding general at some point and I've been elevated to Minister of Defense. He met me at the embassy and expre expressed concern about the delay in my mission. When we finally met President Conte together, it was too late. The rebels had actually taken over most of the country. And the economic community of West African states was now trying to organize a peacekeeping force that will also include Guinea. In the end, the military pact between Guinea and Liberia remained mute. The focus shifted to the role of ECMOG as a rebel spree now became indiscriminate and rampant. Why did we organize ULIMO? We were listening to all that was happening. Hundreds and thousands of our people had run away into Sierra Leone and into the Republic of Guinea. Thousands of them. And when I say our people, I'm not talking about only Madingos. Because you know you were there too. We had hope that Ecomog who have saved the day Following the setting up of the interim government from the Banju Conference, which was bitterly contested, by not only Samuel Doe at the beginning, President Doe, in terms of what ECOMOC should have been doing. But the French-speaking West African states, headed by the Ivory Coast, felt that it was illegal to have brought in ECOMOG. They suspected that ECOMOG was being controlled by Nigeria to help retain President Doe in his post. A meeting was held in Banjul, the Gambia, where President Jawara was the current chairman of the Economic Community of West African States. At the behest of President Babangida, a special meeting of heads of state was held in Banjul. It was at this meeting that a mediation committee was held, uh, was set up on the basis of the protocols of the Defense Pact of ECOWAS, which called for military intervention if there was invasion and threat to peace in the sub-region. All of this came about when the United Nations had delayed carrying on any kind of intervention. You must remember it was also at this time that the Iraq war was going on. So to some extent that drove away attention. The OAU had a legal problem, even though it was politically concerned. This clause, founding clause, that there shall be no interference in the internal affairs of any state. But in any case, according to 
the provisions of Article 7, Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter, the Security Council is responsible to ensure world peace and security, world peace and order. And if those who are affecting peace in the determination of the United Nations Security Council are warned and cautioned to desist from threatening peace, the United Nations is under obligation to warn them first and then to adopt economic sanctions and in the end undertake any military action. But here we were, the United Nations was taking no action. Nevertheless, as part of the legal basis for the involvement of the West African Sub-Region Organization ECOWAS in the conflict, there is a provision in Chapter 7 that says the lack of the United Nations taking direct action should not stop any country or groups of countries from defending themselves. So ECOWAS relied on that legal provision along with the protocols of defense to send in ECOMOC to intervene. But the Ivorians refused to accept that argument because according to them it was not legal. A proper meeting of the ECOWAS heads of state was not convened. And the setting up of the mediation committee was not legal because that should have been done before the war even though it was provided for by the defense protocol. Ekomo came to Monrovia under firing from the MPFL. And the IMPFL got involved. Eventually, Ekomo remained. But his territorial span was very limited until Doe got up and went to the free port and was killed. There were serious concerns when the RUF entered Sierra Leone by way of northern Lofa County, Buedu. This was not an ethnic group headed by Fode Sankor, but they simply wanted power. So that's the difference between the Liberian and the Sierra Leone War in terms of the population configuration and the participants. It's just one big group. And immediately they went on killing people, including us, the refugees. We got message from Kinema. So I took a trip there and saw our people. I went back to Sierra Leone. I came back to Kinema. And we asked the Sierra Leone and the and Guinean governments as to the progress of ECOMOG. ECOMOG was just limited to the surrounding of Monrovia all the way to 1991. And as we sat with the war raging in Sierra Leone and Guinea, we received more people from behind the line, Greater Liberia, from Taylor's Hold, those who could escape, because most of the border areas were blocked. The broad information. Here we were, depending on Ecomog, and our people were being killed behind the line. Were we going to run into the sea? Were we going to get tickets? Those are us who have gone to the States, new people before, and try to get a green card, and then get on the phone and be calling, what's happening? 
was focusing on what was the good of our lives, the value of our lives. See, responsible people from Liberia washing people's clothes, our mothers in the Masina area, the food problem, they had to take this dry goat skin, put it in water, soak it three, four, five days, and then cut it in pieces to substitute for meat. Liberia, what kind of curse was that? So the Muslims in, 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 in the Liberian Muslims in Conakry, they convened a meeting. They said, look, we want to challenge Taylor on the radio as Liberians. But if we talk on behalf of all Liberians, people are still behind the line. So we, the Muslims, let us take the risk and ask Taylor questions on the BBC. That's when they chose me. He said, speak as a representative of a hastily organized concerned group called the Movement for the Redemption of Liberian Muslims, MRM. I went on the air and I asked Taylor, why are you killing our people? You came to overthrow the government, as the old man said. Eh? The government is in Monrovia. You have spread all over. Is that a way to take government? You must account for our people. Or you will face, quote unquote, fierce justice. You have to stop. Wow. People in Connecticut say, look at this refugee. You even got a good slipper on your feet. You trying to challenge Taylor? Of course, Taylor had all the ports. He was exporting logs, exporting this and that, gold, bringing foreign businesses. And we could hardly find food to eat. But we had one thing that didn't need seaports. We had the Almighty God. We had to come back home. We went back to the Guinean government. They said, it's tough. This man got supporters, arms and ammunition and troops of any kind from Burkina Faso. The other day, a couple of years ago, some of the presidential guards in Ouagadougou carrying a special advertisement in the newspaper asking for the rest of their money. And they have come and fought. Presidential guards from Blessed Cambodia fought with Taylor. I can give you a copy of the, the news on the advertisement. They said they wanted their money. Money was still being owed. At that point, I called Ambassador Kape. I said, can you people go to President Momo and tell him that we want to join his forces to fight the RUF and MPFL because they are killing our people too. I have talked to President Conte. He said, you better be happy that they didn't kill you. You look like a soldier with my worn out shoes. But I'll be very frank with you. Eventually, we have just sneaked out of Guinea to come into Liberia. So I called Kape, Senator Chele, and others. So they went to President Momo and said, that, look, we can sit by here. Some of us are former soldiers and we can train people to fight along. We can also fight your people because, you know, they don't seem to have the inspiration. President Momo agreed. And the M16 weapons 
that the earth, some of the earth that soldiers had when they ran across into Sierra Leone, confiscated by the Sierra Leone government, were given back to them. But the point was that there was, there was no ammunition for the MK, M16. So they gave them something called FLOMO. <laughs> like the M1 rifles here, it was not automatic. You put a few rounds in and you have to be shooting one one and everything finishes. Because they were not sure of us. Say you see Nigerians here. Join the army here to come and fight us here and then we take arms and get it in. Let's do it small, small. In a matter of days, the offensive, how you have offensive against Kenema and all the places have been stopped. So Momo developed confidence in the Liberian group. There was no name. And later on, they started saying, okay, let's call it Liberian United Defense Force. So I said, no, no, let's call it this other defense force. So they called me and said, Mr. Kromar, We have set up the army base, training base, trauma. I said, Kape, I said, thank you very much. He, Omer Gumba, Mr. Williams, Mr. Brunel, Samuel Brunel, former minister of uh, public works, they all were refugees there. So the refugees, anti-rebel movement that we're trying to organize. We are rebels. What is a rebel? It's a group that rebels against constituted authority. That's the terminology in international law. So we're anti-rebels. We're a resistant movement. We're not warlords at all. But as a political termin terminology, it's propaganda is used by the rebels. So that I can make everybody look ugly. Oh, what law? What are you behind the scene? We are playing clothes, providing money and support, and coming in the night asking for positions. What are you? We'll come to that later. So I told. Ambassador Kape. I said, he said, Emerson has asked me to leave his position here. He's sending somebody else. I said, oh, just like that. He said, yes, Emerson was the interim president from Banju. I said, but how do you leave the place like that? He said, I want to say. I said, wait, small. I said, I don't want you to leave Freetown, Kape. Look for somebody else to serve as military commander. So he picked Ama Yulu, J. Ama Yulu. I think he was, a, he was formerly the deputy director of the NSA. So they knew about pistols and guns, but I didn't know whether he had training. But he was able to mobilize people, provide leadership. So he was the first field commander. And they were in trauma base training the young people, our people, different, different tribes who were at Waterloo and in Kenema area. They all went down there to train. But the Sierra Leone authorities restricted us to only helping them in Sierra Leone. Every time we talk about Liberia, they say, oh, you're not a tire. So we'll stay in. So we came, after several months, we came to a conclusion after having recaptured several parts of Sierra Leone. In fact, it was our forces, our soldiers, who had to train some of the new officers who had been graduated from specialized training institutes, military institutions in Sierra Leone. <laughs> and one of them was Valentine Strasser was to become the head of state. He got wounded on the front and our men took him. So they knew us very well. But still they didn't want us to go to Liberia. 
So I had $5,000 that I've been keeping. I sent to Corner Bestman, Raja von Bestman. So you got to try and get some logistics because we're having more and more people coming out of Liberia telling us the story of what happening in Greater Liberia. Certain people were free behind Greater Liberia and others were not free. How long could we wait? We had to carry out a resistance movement. So eventually, we broke all the different, different names. MRM, LUDF, this, this and that. So these were not military groups, especially MRM, which is stuck in Conakry there, fighting over refugee food. So we organized ULIMO. We agreed on the name ULIMO, United Liberation Movement for Democracy. And we meant it. But something was happening. As our group succeeded fighting along with uh, the Serbian army. Ambassador Kappa was in Freetown and Ama Yuru was in Kenema. News reached us in Conakry that some sort of unnecessary competition was rising between them. And people belonging to their sub ethnic groups were beating drums and dancing and in praises and hoping that they would be leaders in Liberia. That was very interesting to me because the bay hadn't been born in the eye of big like that. So we started sending delegations to Sierra Leone. One of the first delegations was the one headed by Professor Yulu. No, not you. Uh, now you. Oh, man, now you. Former Minister of State for Presidential Affairs. On the door. He carried a group there and started talking to them. He said, you stop this thing here. We haven't even entered Liberia. Another delegation was headed by Sifos Gallo from Conakry. We paid for goats, sheep, and other things, cola, so that they could stop the confusion. Unfortunately, and may his soul rest in peace, Sifos Gallo remained talking until he was attacked by pressure. And he died. We sent Jiggins Scott and other people. And the late uh, Philip Davis, former FPRC managing director. They all went there. There was a lingering problem. Lingering problem. So finally, Uh, President, was it Valentine Strasser? He sent for me. He said, if you don't talk to your people, I will kill all of you out of this Sierra Leone. So we called everybody. Some of the top commanders on the front. Ama Yulu, they all came with Omer Gumba, Omer Samuel Brunel, Omer Amadou Salib, they all came. Um, who was in town? Rai Siki, Bobler, um, Major Bobler, formerly of the AFL, but he was now a civilian, and uh, Kape, who was in Freetown. So they all came to, meet, to the meeting except uh, Kape. He said he was busy trying to send uh, supplies. He never came to the meeting. And so I waited for him. So he came and I asked him, what happened? Because Radio Siki and uh, Paul Allen Will were telling me that they were not being encouraged to join the group. So I told him, I said, look, Kape, this thing, nobody, nobody getting paid. It's a refugee group. In fact, we are all being targeted. So open it up. These people have experiences. Uh, Radio Siki was uh, Deputy Minister of Finance and Paul Allen Will was also Deputy Minister, in fact, the last Minister of Information when he and Doe went to the, to the port. So open it up. He said, well, we've got to be careful. You know, 
do a major operation and you can't just have any kind of civilian coming in. So I said, well, we have to go to a meeting now to discuss the problem between you and Yulu. He said, the boy is frisky. With all due respect to him, and his soul rest in peace, Kape. I put him there. You gave me the freedom to put him there, and I put him there, and he's not respecting me. I said, okay, that's your son. You forget about it. So the commanders from the front came. They said they wanted a board of board of directors to be set up. And some people didn't agree with that, especially Kape. Then we organized another meeting and then everybody voted. So I decided that a board would be set up. And they asked me to serve as interim chairman. I told them I just wanted to be something like a patron of, you know. And, and because I didn't see any kind of specific position there that was attractive or, or necessary for me. So they said, okay, you serve as interim chairman of the board. Some BBC reporter was there, he put on the air. That's when Kape went on the air too and said that uh, he didn't accept that. And if Ama Yulu goes to uh, Kenema, he should be arrested. I said, well, this is very bad. I don't spoil our name here. Because soon, President uh, Strasser will tell us to leave. So we took, we took off. We turned the country. I don't know how that reporter got that news. Network Africa, soon in the morning. Hmm. My fella came and knocked at the door. I said, what happened? He said, General Kappa is dead. I said, you're a foolish man. I'm just coming from Freetown. The man was there. You talking about he's dead? He said, yes. He was killing Kenema. I said, he's not in Kenema. He's in Freetown. Then we started calling. I called Mr. Brunel. He said, yeah, that's true. I said, what? Put behind us, killing us, then we're killing ourselves? How it happened? We set up a committee immediately. Head of the scene, Mr. Samuel Brunel. I called that report, and by then, they were all in Kenema. The Salyun uh, Army arrested a whole lot of people, including Amo Yulu, to answer for what had happened. Because we were foreigners on, on foreign land. The report that came from Simon Brunel said when General Kappa arrived in Kenema, he had, uh, Yulu had already gone ahead of him. But because of this announcement that Kappa made and said that commanders on the front should take no orders from Yulu and that he, Kape, will take care of things. There were some guys who were close to both of them. The commanders, they were close to both of them. So according to the investigation conducted by the Brunel Committee, General Kappa contacted some of these commanders who are very, very uh, powerful. And he said he wanted to see them at his house. But they could not go to his house that night. So they decided to go in the morning to General Kappa's house. Who, who are his bodyguards there, by the way? Because Kenema was tense, apparently. According to the report, a foolish thing happened. A very seriously foolish thing happened. The boys that were called by General Kape took Ama Yulu's rare pickup to go to General Kape. You can imagine what would have happened. According to the investigation, when the vehicle was approaching General Kappa's house, some of his men, yeah, said, oh, 
Je, ama hilo kama ni wanatibo? You see? Too much where people have problems. And the vehicle, operational vehicle of one of them is coming. We put something on the back holding arms. So the general people coming. How many people coming? They got guns. General said, oh, so the attack. They started exchanging fire. That's account, according to the report, Kappa was gone down. For nothing. For nothing. We're leaving Kappa and Peter Royal fighting our opposition. What opposition? Fresh human being like that. So, we have problems again with the Serbian government. So we are killing each other. They locked Ahmad Yulu up. He was never freed until we came to Liberia. Roosevelt Johnson then, a friend of Kape, rebelled against us. But I had to talk to the old people eventually. We all got back together again. And started preparing to come to Liberia. I went back to Conakry. What was the status of Ecomog? I came back before the death of Kape. I talked to President Momo. Why he can't help? He said, We already got Ecomog there. I said, Yes, but the fighting conventional war. We can be supplementary. Why you can't help? We want to bring in more men and train them. Because it is our war. Sierra Leone soldiers are being killed in Liberia and in Sierra Leone. War coming from us. It is our war. So he told me, look, we don't have ammunition for the number of men you want to bring. We heard that there is some ammunition that shot landed in Guinea by the dual government. Why don't you go to Morovia and ask President Sawyer <laughs> to give the permission and tell the Guinean government to allow us to take the ammunition. I say, with all due respect to you, sir, I'm very surprised. Whole-headed state like you, you can't talk to Sawyer, you can't talk to President Conte. He said, that's exactly why I can't talk to them, because I'm head of state, and we look very cheap on our part to go look for ammunition on the side. I'm telling you, that was 1991 or so, I took the risk of coming to Morovia. Even though I heard that Prince Johnson was here. Break away from IMPFL. I mean, yes, broke away from MPFL. They became the INPFL. I said, but Prince Johnson is in town there. He said, yes, I'm not sending you to him. So I managed somewhere I came to Monrovia. I met Professor Sawyer. And the mediation team was there in Monrovia. The ECOWAS mediation team of Interfaith Council saw so, uh, the commissioner there. They have been going up and down trying to suggest a way to move forward. I said, Sawyer, so, uh, some ammunition. Ammunition are in uh, Conakry. We want you to help so that they can be transferred to President Momo. He said, oh, no problem. I said, we're trying to organize. What's the situation here with Ecomog? He said, well, they're just confined here. 
I want to confess something here today. I'm not a military person. But as part of that early history I told you about, when my father was rejected from being appointed as ambassador and he, because he was a so-called countryman, etc., and he told us to read and read and read to find out why, I took special interest in the PAIGC of Amika Cabral, a liberation struggle in Guinea-Bissau and the Cape Verde. Amika Cabral wanted to apply the principles of the proletariat because they were decimated ethnic configuration in Guinea-Bissau, so they couldn't have a homogeneous proletariat or grassroots to organize their liberation forces from. So what did they do? They established the connectivity by ethnic clusters and showed the people that they had a common destiny to get the independence of Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde. I studied everything that was written by him and about him. As you may know, he came here and President Toba named uh, uh, the Amica Cabra estate in, on the old road after him. One of the first acts of liberation gesture. And then he was gone down in Conakry later on. But his story was so passionate. He wanted to fight war without fighting war. He wanted to fight war without weapons. And that impressed me. So I had a whole thing inside me. And so I told Sawyer to tell the Ekuma people that maybe we can enter somewhere. They said, oh, no, 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 no. We don't trust you Liberians. We don't trust you. So we went back. And Dr. Sawyer promised to send Dr. Kessel, the then Minister of Defense, in the interim government. To come to Corner Creek. But as things turned out, it didn't work. We didn't get any ammunition. And so we couldn't carry the men that we were supposed to carry to Guinea. So in short, we had to go on our own. Take the risk. More and more, how you have men? <laughs> they were having a bonanza in Upper Lufa. So we decided militarily, we had a military meeting in Kenema and said, look, the dire is scarce, we have to go. The RUF kept getting strong, way up in Daru, other places. Arms and ammunition being supplied. So we decided to take the, the back route, the lower route, and that had to be Cape Mount County. So, <laughs> we're not supplied arms and ammunition. We just find a way and we took them from the Sierra Leone Army. Few weapons. But one important and good thing, one important realization that made us optimistic that something will happen. Looking at the tenets and study days of the PAIGC operation in Guinea-Bissau. Who are the people fighting for Charles Taylor? Most of those who are first soldiers of Charles Taylor coming from Bapolu, Lofa, Cape Mount, etc. were our cousins. We knew that we would succeed. We are not going to shoot anybody. We will use radio communication. And you ask any of the serious MPFL commanders from the time, they will tell you. So we got several multi-frequency radio communication that could cover two, three countries. And you can change your frequency at any time as you move on. 
That's what I learned. So we sat in the Liberia and went to Jinewane, Cape Mao, and Mara River, Congo. We started operating, breaking the radio code. Eventually, we took over Cape Mao and Bombay counties, and we took over without fighting. Without fighting, we took over Lofa County, Zozo, Vonjama, and Kolahu. And later on, Foya. No fighting. I've been uh, brought up in Sevilahu, the Kolahu, Bani area there. So it was easy for us. There was no fighting. I could speak Lama very well, like my mother. My two grandmothers are Lama people. So I spoke Lama on the radio communication. So we use that a whole lot to avoid actual battle. I can tell you today that the battle that took place between Ulimo J and Ulimo K was more than the one that took place between Ulimo and NPFL. Any of them will tell you. Because we knew that most of the soldiers that they were sending towards us were our cousins. So I went on the radio. I will ask this question. After they had recognized me. Because they wouldn't believe that I'm the one on the radio. This is the Haji Kroma commander of Ulimo. Chairman of Ulimo. Then I asked one big question to the soldiers. NPFL soldiers. How many of you are from Addington? Then they say, oh, what's more? After a few minutes, they say, nobody else from Addington. Why? Addington ain't got population? I said, let me ask you. You know your commander name is so, 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 Sion. Say, yeah. I said, you know that's my mother's name, Sion? Seba? Say, yes. Oh. Where now? Where are you coming from? I said, my mom from Juanita. He said, cool. Cool, yeah, what That's our big brother. I said, let me ask you. If you see me, you will shoot me? He said, call her bay. I said, but I got some of your cousins here. If you see them, you will shoot them? He said, call her bay. I said, but what will we do now? He said, level, you are the big people now. You and Taylor then. I said, but you can do something. So every time Taylor got ammunition, we got our share. <laughs> Bugger then will bring the ammunition. They will run away, they will steal it and bring it. So we didn't have occasion to fight. And I can tell you, that was one, one of the main strategies we used to capture Banga. The Banga battle went ran only for one hour. Because we had talked sufficiently to the commanders. There's no need for you to shoot your brother. The other thing I used was Barrow. Because many of the boys from Bikana, Grand Bassa, and number five district, they were part of the NPFL. I got that information, so I would call and I said, Who are member Barrow? He said, Oh, Preso, we plenty here. I said, So, you want to tell me when you see a Preso you're shooting? He said, What? I ain't messing, I can't shoot him. You understand? So there were a lot of Baro people in Banga for that fight. So when we entered Banga, the commander of the artillery, the NPF artillery, he was the first to join us. So we made deputy commander for the Ulimo artillery. We didn't know anything about artillery. So he was there. But who you are going to shoot? The people who you come to fight to join you. And I will tell you one of the bad things that extended the war. So that's how we captured Banga. I had seen some kind of video, Sky News from London, doing a documentary on the NPFL. And I saw a little boy called uh, Commander of the Small Boy Unit, fearfully dressed. When we captured Banga, we took him. Yeah, his name just came to my mind. Alvin Cooper. 
you know, a little buzzer boy or something. He said he was the commander of the small boys unit on NPFL. I said, what small boy units? All kinds of things hanging on him. And they told me on the radio. And you never knew that we didn't deal with small children business. I said, well, where you are going and, 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 and you discover a village where you left your little brother and while leaving you had to carry him. You couldn't leave him there. You know, we had something like oil and water which couldn't mix. I was trying to be a commander and a professor at the same time. Cigarette. I've never smoked cigarette in my entire life, let alone opium or liquor. You ask any officer of Ulimo whether they could smoke cigarette, cigarette around me. Of course, we didn't have any money to go buy drugs. We were hearing all the drugs, the children, this and that. Drug? I said, big generals around me couldn't smoke cigarette. You ask any one of them around me. Including even big generals like Roosevelt Johnson and uh, Ahmad Yulu, they couldn't smoke around me. They said I was uh, a what? A soldier in my mind and civilian in my heart. Something like that. But I knew that something bad had happened to us and with our trust in God we'll come back to Liberia and Liberia will be Liberia again. So Avin Cooper was brought to Conakry and we set up the CIA Conakry International Academy elementary to junior senior high school where my children attended. And Avin Cooper and my first son Adama slept in the same bed and went to school. So you would never step back on that front. I think some of his parents or his relatives are in town here. Alvin Cooper. I don't know where he is now. Left him in Guinea. He went to school with my son. So these are the approaches we took. Because our objective was not to get Monrovia. Was not to take power. If we wanted power, it was shown in 1992 during the octopus. When he taught my bird. Akomok sent for us because it wasn't easy in Morovia yet. The NPFL came strong. NPFL collapsed. They had to send Prince Johnson to Nigeria. Then the Black Bird had been trained by him and saw they were around. But they were not in the bush, so they were not experienced. And Akomok, for all due respect, they were used to own a conventional war. So the NPFL had taken away the whole card where they were there. That's Stockton Bridge. Here, yeah. the little boy railroad was shot in that place. I said, little boy, I mean, young soldier. He said, you can't come to Monrovia. You all stay in the bush. They pick him up. So we helped. And eventually we were the one to stop the MPFL, octopus, from taking over Monrovia. And the call is a mission accomplished. I called General Olori. He even saw it. So mission accomplished. Say so yeah. I ordered the officers to return to Tottenham Bird. If we wanted power, who could have taken power that day? The whole place was confused up. Who could have taken power? You want to know the intent of a group of fighters? Look at the direction they came in the war. They come and bypass Moroya, they're looking for presidency. No, we wanted to stop Taylor. And that group that kept crossing to go into Sierra Leone. And we knew that we couldn't fight a regular war. First of all, we didn't have weapons, we didn't have ammunition. <laughs> so we're forced, beside the fact that these were our relatives, we didn't have the weapons. 5,000 hours in fire war. <laughs> Come over one box of AK rounds. That was something on the side that we bought with the 5,000 hours. That's the one we fought. All the area 20 person, you see five person with weapons. That's how we fought the war. We didn't have sea ports, we didn't have rubber, we didn't have logs. In fact, we banned any kind of diamond operation. 
if you leave my territory, if you know some people are passing behind me, you know, because we didn't believe this would be the case. We're not trying to paint an angel like operation here. People exchange fire in places. Perhaps people in crossfire. But we didn't have any group that were going to fight. Manokyo. Let me tell you this one now. When we're in Conakry, a Manokyo friend of mine at the height of the war in Morovia called me. I want you to please listen to this. I want you to really listen to this. Because you, the commissioners, you have an arduous task. You have an arduous task. I can imagine how you're being bombarded with huge volumes of information and misinformation as well. How are you going to decipher? Eh? There's a historic forum here. We're taking off on the Quran. Treasury. But I've already dealt with that issue on uh, the principles of law in the opening statement. A very important person has come here, not that important at the time, but he was Manokyo, he called me, a haji. I am in Monrovia. I want to go to the United States. I want to pass through Conakry. I want you to pick me up at the airport. I said, what? What all this model girl business, Madiwo? He said, yes. I don't look at you as Madiwo. I look at you as a friend. I said, come. And he came. We went to the airport. We got to the airport with some of our boys. They didn't know him. We came to the house. I didn't have my family then. We talk until 2 o'clock in the morning. Then by coincidence, some people outside found out that this guy was minor Gyo. They gave him nothing on the door. They thought the guy had done something to me. When I opened the door, he said, oh, come outside, I want to talk to you. There's an NPF man they sent to you to cut your throat. I said, you know him? He said, no. I said, he's not an NPF man. If he's going to cut my throat, then let it be cut. But I will never release him out. I said, let's carry him to the Guinean government. I don't think they wanted to carry the Guinean government. I think they are going to wave him somewhere. And who is this person? I carried him to the airport back, put him on the plane, and he left. Dr. Joseph Koto, currently Minister of Education. Ask him. So we're not targeting people. We'll talk about Doki. Doki called me. Kroma is a guy I said, don't look for what? And he said, tell her, go to Burkina Faso. What are we looking for in Nima? You do look for my farm there? I'm sorry he's not living today. Doki. Who gave him a solemn promise that we're not in the business of looking for territory. So there's the character and the objective behind the wall. So I want to stop here. You can ask me questions about the remaining activities, the different peace agreements. A lot of bad things happen. Those people who are not wearing uniforms, the kinds of things they did, both in Liberia and outside, to prolong the war. When we go to sign an agreement, Eh? A particular president will say that he doesn't want bullying on the council of state. What you got to do if that you're in the council of state? Why you don't want bullying? Oh, because the other president is supporting him. We we'll argue until they were cancel the meeting. Now we we'll come home, that we're supposed to insult us. You can, you can finish this one piece, something here. That used to happen. There are people in Morocco too. Political people. Like Banga, when we talk Banga, 
before we talk about that, they have been telling President Abacha that Haji Kroma and Chancellor. Oh, forgot one important thing. They were Konami. They are joined. Abacha was almost convinced until we took over Bala. Then he asked Jeremiah in Morovia. So who is in Bala? Because Jeremiah has been influenced to testify to him by phone that Till and I were Konami. But you know what? I was talking to Charles Taylor on the radio. Through Mamadou Salif, my cousin, that was his foreign minister. I told him that there was no need for further war. Because I knew he, he wanted to uh, talk on the radio to intercept some of our calls to his people. So, Mamadou Salif made a contribution to peace in this country. He encouraged me to talk to Charles Taylor so that there could be some degree of, of cooperation. Mamadou Salif was the one that encouraged me to find a way for Taylor to go to Nigeria when we're in Accra, Ghana. Yes. So, when Abacha asked who was in charge of Bala? They said Kromana there. And you know what happened? The LPC was giving support to come and fight us in Bala from where in Basa? Why? Because they didn't want Al Haji Kromana to be like Dwight Eisenhower to defeat Chancellor and come to Monrovia as a hero. So then their chances of becoming president or something who have been gone. So they encourage that group to come to us and fight us. Remain fighting us until Charles Taylor regrouped and came back. This is what happened. They were not satisfied with that. They sent one of their key people to different countries in the South region. Who can't allow Haji Kromar to stay in Bala? He's more dangerous. Dangerous where? <coughs> That's why the late Romeo Horton at one of the meetings he came from Washington, Maryland, somewhere. He said he came purposely to the peace conference in Abuja. 12 o'clock midnight, he knocked on my door in the hotel room. They allowed him in. He said, I'm going to tell you something. I said, yes, sir, prof. He didn't even realize that he was dean of the business college when I was graduating. And he had written something on my thesis. He said, I was told that you have holes on your head and you hate Congo people. Oh. And that's why I came here for to watch you in action. He said, I've been here for three days now. And we sat over there in the lobby of the Hilton Hotel, Church Chipotle, Oscar Puya, all of them hanging around. He said the fact that you come and joke on the people, tears come down, and you're laughing and moving around, advising people. I couldn't help it. I had to come to you tonight to confess. I said, but it is very interesting. He said, why? I said, because I also heard that you got horns on your head. And that you hate country people to the most. Then we started laughing. What are you hating Congo people for? Who are Congo people? After all these years, you cannot accept each other? King South Brussels, who did not even know these people who came out three months or four months? And he went and threatened the people and said, You shouldn't do anything with these people, you people are all one. At that particular time, we had our blood in us. We believe in history. We know that the homo sapiens came from black people. The first men, people, formed several million years ago were black people. That's why I was feeling that Adam and Eve were black. Because the oldest people black, then how did they come from white people? 1996. This is my last comment. 
the Bagra in Monrovia. The Bagra in Monrovia. One night, the phone rang. Who's this? The other chief, the Ama Yulu. What happened? You got any RPG bombs there? Eh? I thought it was a big joke. We in Marovia, interim government and everything, you asked me for RPG bombs. I said, what do you want a bomb for? He said, you are living on 9th Street or so, 10 or 9th Street. He said, for the past three nights, something I pick up. Roosevelt Johnson said, hey, boys, this is something I pick up here. We'll call ourselves in stuff. And we have to defend ourselves. I said, I can't stop this nonsense. What is this? I pick up the phone and call Roosevelt Johnson. He said, the man lied. He didn't want to send somebody to me. A couple of days later, they said, one Bawu, B-A-R-W-U, a cousin or so, either a cousin of Bawu or Bawu, a cousin of Yulu, was found dead on the beach in the vicinity of Roosevelt Johnson's house. A crime man. And they were threatening to go and attack Roosevelt Johnson's house. So the matter was reported to the council of state. But before we could handle that situation, it had become tough. The inhabitants of Cinco and Congo Town, they were getting fed with this government here. You know, Sangawula was big. We in a serene car going up and down. So the boys set up roadblocks. They say, you're not passing here today until you take, can take care of Amma Yulu and Roosevelt Johnson business here. They're scaring us here. So we beg, I got down, talk to them, and, the, and remove the roadblocks. We convened a meeting, and we invited the CID. And they said, yes, they went there and they saw, saw a corpse, dead body. And it was recognized as that same cousin of Bau. While that was going on, there was a friction between Ama Yulu version of Yulimo J. I think he was in Yulimo J at the end. And Roosevelt Johnson's version over the National Bank because they had a slot. Initially, they had given the position to Ryan Siki to be governor. Later on, a letter came for initial square to replace Riley Siki. Apparently, initial square was on the side of, uh, or Roosevelt Johnson was supporting the change. And Roosevelt Johnson was officially the head of Ulimo J. And the Amma Yuru group came and said it was not a decision taken by all of them and rather Siki should stay as governor of the, of the bank. So those two things were going on simultaneously. I don't know which one contributed to which. But the situation became very delicate. Ambassador Yankee, the UN special representative here, came to us. The Council of State. That included me, Bole, Oscar Kuya, Sanka Ulo. And said, you are ineffective. You are running a government here and people have taken over the streets. I am raiding each other every night. So we invited General Nyege, who said, you are in charge of security here. And we also asked the police, you know, the Minister of Justice, to the police, to investigate this day by the business. So they invited the two men, Ama Yulu and Roosevelt Johnson, to the police and to the Ministry of Justice. So Ama Yulu went to the, to the two areas. But Roosevelt Johnson could not go. He called me and said that his people advised him that he shouldn't leave because people set a trap for him so they can shoot him. I said, but it looks bad. Because we suspended them from their positions. I said, but it looks bad 
for you to get up and go and then you defy the council of state. So I call his, one of his best friends. Maybe he's in town today. Hezekiah Bowen. I said, Bowen, say, go and talk to Roosevelt. Let me just show her face. It means I just to take she from her face. Because it looks bad. Bowen went after sometime he came by. He said, the man said he's scared. Some, some boys are around there scaring him. I said, but what, what are we going to do? And they were still carrying on their, 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 their nightly attacks. So we called John Nyinge. We said, you have to protect the country. Something bad happening in Monrovia here. So he said, okay, what all you have to do, let us first ask Roosevelt Jones to come. And say he refused, you people should send in an arrest warrant. He gave us a copy. And we will carry it. In fact, give us a warrant, we will carry it. I'm telling you. There was an announcement put in the air that people around there, living around Roosevelt Johnson and East Post, should try to move away from them because of the situation they were involved in. That morning, I was sitting at my house after the arrest warrant had been given to Ecomog. I just heard that near Sankawa's house, I don't know whether that 20th Street, was that 20th Street? That road going, the, the one that goes straight to the back of the JFK. 20th Street, eh? Okay. They said something has started there. Some exchange. I said, but where's Akuma? They said Akuma on the mirror. Road. But John Taylor is there with the police. And that's when I first heard about the butt naked business. They said there's one guy there called butt naked, and they, 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 they're exchanging fire. I said, but this is a common situation. They should have carried the, the arrest warrant. Where are they? Why was it now? Because my house, when you leave a moment coming, uh, where the Ghanaian embassy is resident is now, that was my house, where Bishop Kula was living right next to one another. And then you had to pass the Nigerian embassy before you reached the charge to them. Then our fellows came and said, hey, Chief, it's not easy. I said, what happened? They said, a combined force of crown people are coming with tear queer. And they're singing some of song. I said, what kind of song? Like, what does song say? They said, your hair and Chatila hair. Oh. <laughs> my hair? Say yeah. And it happened that my house was before charge to the house. So if anything on my head will go first before I to the head. So I couldn't take it lightly. I called John Nigger. He said, oh, we are sending the troops. I said, is it any truth? You hear the song of us singing? That's how come we started to pull up. And we didn't have, my people were not here in Morovia. They were in a Swan Maga district. They had not been disarmed. But they have few people around me. So they put up a defensive around uh, the FE area. And eventually we confined the fighting because Marola is a peninsula. I was applying the same strategy again. Okay? You have to contain the enemy. Marola is a peninsula like a Mesorado River and it has uh, the sea. So we, we couldn't allow them to come to City Hall and go across the bridge. So eventually we squeeze them to the barracks. Then some guys started throwing long range bombs to the barracks. To the barracks, the BDC barracks. Where I think 10,000 people are packed there. Somebody said they were being held as hostage. Some said they didn't have any choice, but they were just dead. They were stranded. I got a call when I first bomb missed. John Fair come on. He called and said, Come on. I know they're not you. I think I think you're sending a bomb here to us. But I bought us any. They're not only crown people here. They play well mixed. He said, hold on, let me post.
Jesus on my own here, on the phone. Then I had a person say, Salam alaikum. I said, Who's this? He said, I shake a fuma. I said, Why do you have a garage? You mean you shake a man? He said, we have to come here to try to calm things down because we are a mediation committee. He said, we are mess here. You have soiree here. I said, which one is that? You soiree. They get in the fundu. I said, I don't think people should worry. Look at the person who's saying that uh, missile or whatever will face him. Will set, will, will look for him. When met, I can't remember his name now. They, they have one pickup I ran the Minister of Lands and Mines between education and uh, information lands and mines. They couldn't even operate the weapon. I told the boys to take out the whatever nozzle and disarm them. And they ran back. So in Morovia, I joined Akumor. The looting was going on. I provided a pickup. The deputy Akumor commander, General Seth Obeng, asked him, he's in Ghana. We're communicating on, on, on the phone. I sent two pickups and wrote down my telephone numbers and large one. Sent to Vitan because that's where the looting was taking place now. Anybody being the subject victim of looting, if you can make it, call this number. Put your bank number, put my private number. On two pickups. Up and down, up and down. When they finally were able to leave this place here. And the matter was settled. During that same occasion, on uh, Ashman Street, up on the hill, hmm, the Catholic radio station was burned down. What is this? You're trying to continue to crime people in that, that rich store, burning that radio station? Then we heard some of my boys heard a plane that night to get rid of certain people. Chipotle, Sawyer, Formula, like a who, who is who. They had a whole list. But of course when these things happen, you hear all kinds of rumors. But Sawyer was already at the base. You know Sawyer is a smart guy. <laughs> you always one step ahead. <laughs> he was already with John Nigga in one little guest room there. I met him there and we discussed. Why I kill these people? So I told my man, I said, go at, I said, at Formula's house. He said, part of the children there with the old lady. And Formula is just there. I said, oh, where is Chipotle? He said, I don't know. I said, you're searching the whole Mama Point, I mean, uh, Snapper Hill area. I think he has to be there. I said, what's up with all the Catholic people that they, they burn their, their, their radio station? Where, where is the bishop? You know, just check around there. Then I called General Bank. I said, what happened to the Echo Mall? You better go up on Ashmore Street. He said, oh, we are trying to establish a corridor. Oh. It was not easy. So the boss went to Formula. I said, you're calling me. You're putting him on the phone. I said, Formula, you said that in that place there that your name is on the list. He said, oh, we are here to defend ourselves. I said, what you have? He said, you got one pistol. I said, one pistol? I said, where the old lady? Oh, come on, I'm not leaving from this place here. I said, where the old lady? I sent my vehicle. We collected the old lady, Mary, Mary, Mary Brunel. She was a strong woman too. She said, I'm not going anywhere. Nobody can drive me. I said, okay. Whichever one you carry the children come by. So they put them in, the, uh, in my Jeep. Two Jeeps. I mean, they fill out the two Jeeps. So they, they carry them to Logan Town. Then I told the guy, I said, go back for that high-headed man. So the guy in the family said, I'm not leaving. So they found out he didn't even have one round in that pistol. He said he was sitting down there. So I talked to him on the phone and said, I beg you, do it for your mind, do it for God. That's how he left. A couple of days later, weeks, they all left to go places. So we are thankful to God that we always want to play a role. Our objective in Ulimo 
was not targeting anybody. If we target anybody, we have targeted ourselves. I couldn't target Loma people because my two grandmothers are Loma. I didn't have that kind of a <laughs> power to draw up a policy and say, go and kill those people. What are weapons? But it's very possible that some people may have died from crossfire, from different things that people were doing that we didn't know about. From some of our own people died. So before I close, we're really sorry that this whole thing here happened. There was no need, like the old man said. Better go, you want any gold? Why well, you can't go get any gold? Rooster, sheep, in it. Rabbit, how to get killed in it? What are they going to do in any good business? We're going to get you stories after stories. We say sorry to the Liberian people. Mm. Unnecessary death. There's a power. He said he believed in democracy. People had nothing to do with this thing here. Power greediness. Until today. You can learn your lessons. What do you want to happen to this country now? The whole country might burn up or somebody might colonize us. Sorry. Let's pray. Every day. You go to church. Pray for the souls of the departed. You go to a mosque. You pray every day. That's what I do. Pray for everybody. Anybody who died in this place here. You have a children in the streets. With crutches. Some of them blind. Who cares? Reconciliation got to look at that. We got to look. At the down trodden. They don't have any hope. Those who can see and they don't have crutches. They become armed robbers. Then we're surprised. Let's feel sorry for one another. The world laughing at us. We say we got white people are consultants and partners at TRC. They're bringing the money to help us. Because it's a historical task. I asked the American ambassador. Propaganda, propaganda. As the ambassador, Ambassador Booth, what's your intention with the TRC business? He said, why are you asking me about my intention? What you that grandpa want? It's what you have. This is your country. What is the progress that has been made? Ladies and gentlemen, with reconciliation in this country. I was appointed, Charles Taylor appointed me as the first chairman of reconciliation. That's all. But somebody wrote me a letter. I've never seen an intelligent young man like that guy. I was on my way coming to Marora from Conakry. He sent a simple letter. He said, we heard you've been, you've been appointed. We're very happy. We're looking for to your coming. He said, but remember Dialo Telly. What kind of letter is that? Remember Dialo Telly. So some guy picked it up because he knew that they were going to pass through the airport. That was during the Taylor administration now. They took the letter and looked at his own. They didn't have to come out. They said, you remember one of your fuller friends. Not knowing that was one of the most important messages I ever received in my life. Who was Jalo Telly? Jalo Telly was the first Secretary General of the OAU from Guinea, a fuller man. 
After several years, he retired. And Secretary Cohen died. He again died, my colleague. Let's work together. The main minister of justice, he went back to Conakry and what happened? He went to Camp Boaro. Maximum security prison. He remained there and died. So Kekula told me in the letter, remember Jalo Telly. The plan he used at the airport, they didn't get any message out of it. That's how come I didn't come here. To assume a position that is combined with what you're doing today. And I was prepared to do it. So we have gained considerable, substantial success in reconciliation. The evidence is so glaring. Mr. Sally, you go on ahead to apologize to the Liberian people for a statement that the Muslim must come down and she insulted herself. That was a courageous thing to do. To accept that you did something wrong. Quote unquote, with all due respect, she said, that was a stupid statement I made. I don't know what motivated her, but she made a statement like that. We all heard on the BBC. But she stood up and said, I'm sorry. I insult myself. I call myself stupid. And the librarian people went and voted for her. Secret ballot. What kind of forgiving are you want now? In the fact of day, every day, oh, the Loma and the Mexico, they're fighting, they're doing this and that. The All Liberal Coalition Party has the highest number of legislators in Lofa County. Secret ballot. Six different tribes in that place. I won the presidential election in the first round, especially in Vojama. What will you say about that? Secret ballot, nobody being forced. Somebody else will be against somebody, then they win. Then they give you 50% of the legislative seats. Indeed, we have made substantial progress in reconciliation. Let us build on that and go forward. We need to have some kind of national conference during which time we kind of face reality. There has to be a meeting between representatives of the American Liberians and the indigenous people. No history you can talk about in this place here unless you talk about American Liberians and country people. So we have to reconcile. There's the truth of the Reconciliation Commission. Be proud of yourself as Congo people. My wife is Congo. Now you laws are all Congo. We are all Liberians here. Be proud of yourself. Come forward. I represent the Congo people. You may not be as many as the indigenous, and we are all mixed up, but we can still identify our linkages. Let us sit and talk this thing here. Nobody must say because you're Congo, you gotta be president. That's some of the problem there. Upper cross mentality. We got it here, Gio. Mana let go. Who told you? Who voted for you? How many come up and voted for you? I want members as a leaf. Very conscientious woman. You see, that's our wife. That's a leaf wife. And we gotta get one of the elders to go by and tie our cola again. <laughs> after we talk, after we talk in her office one day, she got up to go to her desk. And I thought I was saying something very simple. I said, you know what, Mr. Selif? I said, I'm very proud of this country. She stopped. She was going to her desk. She stopped. She turned around and came, walked back to me. She held her hand and hugged me. I said, oh, what did I say? She didn't reply. But I concluded that every day at some hotel, we, be, we have failed being Liberians. We fail in this country. The place is too bad. But I told her, I am proud of my country. I love my country. We are academic, academicians, international law. What is one of the requirements of sovereignty? They said you must have a defined territory, a defined population, but not only that. 
but that they must be loyal to the state. They must be loyal to the nation. Your tears must come down not only because of your cousin, but because of the country. How many of us can cry because of Liberia? Has somebody had to slap us before we cry? How many of us? There's elephant meat. Everybody wants to divide and eat it. Nobody concerned about who kill it. You understand? We're sorry. Let's pray that nobody dies here again. What about guns? What about sickness? Let's take care of our health. All kinds of other clinics around town here today. Anybody put on some white cloth, you open a place and give the people all kinds of medicine and they just die like that. HIV. HIV. One of my friends died the other day. His family came. Oh, the man knew he had HIV. I said, you can't respect the dead body. There were 10 of them. I said, how many of you have taken your test? Then the right face got shot. Oh, I was like bring people. Because that, that disease is a killer. Worse than the guns. I didn't see the guns. But now I see your soul, your flesh. HIV is doing something serious in this country today. We have to love each other. If we don't want to be hypocritical, we have to be concerned about all those things that take away lives. The HIV is one of them. Among all young people, they say between 15 and 27 years old, but it's also above that and below that. Let us be honest. We apologize for anybody. It was not our intent. It will never be our policy. Anybody who targets anybody, you're targeting yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Witness, for appearing today and <clears throat> making your presentation before the Commission. Not only did you attempt to trace the root causes of our conflict or historical antecedents, but you've also explained in details your personal experiences the conflict of color, divide, ethnicity conflict in our country, your role during the period of the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, as well as advancing recommendations that you believe will assist our country move forward and make progress towards national reconciliation. We at the Commission appreciate that. <coughs> And also the fact that you recognize that wrongs were done and you feel sorry for what has happened, for whatever role you may have played or people under your command may have played that resulted to the death or targeting of others. I want to thank you very much for that and beg your indulgence that because time is fast spent, the Commission will reserve questions for tomorrow morning when we reconvene. As you yeah, come by here? <laughs> okay, okay. What, what time? 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Well, then you gotta help me with some gas level. <laughs> <laughs> we, we will facilitate that, sir. Thank you very much. We'll resume tomorrow at 10.